scariest thing to me about Juno are the unknowns. So much about the environment that we'll have to withstand is unknown. Nothing's really certain about what's going to happen. It's a monster. It's unforgiving. It's relentless. It's spinning around so fast, it's gravity. It's like a giant slingshot, slinging rocks, dust, electrons, whole comets. Anything that gets close to it becomes its weapon. It just so happens, deep inside this body are the secrets we're after. Secrets about our early solar system. biggest and baddest planet in the solar system and it's got the biggest and baddest radiation and the biggest and baddest magnetic field. The background radiation that we're exposed to on Earth is about a third of a rad. What we expect to see at Jupiter is about 20 million rad. No spacecraft has ever flown this close to Jupiter, flown this deep into the radiation belts. So the real trick is, we gotta go in close, get the data, and get out. And the first time we go in, that's the most dangerous. We call it Jupiter Orbit Insertion, J-O-I. Nothing's really certain about what's going to happen. There are many theories about the origins of Jupiter. Hundreds of scientists and engineers in five countries have been working for more than 10 years to design and build the Juno spacecraft. This solar-powered probe will travel 400 million miles into space with instruments uniquely built to withstand deadly radiation and the fiercely cold environment of Jupiter. Juno will conduct an unprecedented examination of the atmosphere, the interior, and the vast magnetic field of the giant planet. I've been asked in to help with the gravity science experiment. Measuring Jupiter's gravity depends on measuring changes in the spacecraft velocities that goes around Jupiter. What we're looking at is for variations in that acceleration rate that tells us something about the change in the gravitational field of Jupiter as it gets closer to the surface associated with a mass structure inside. And so what we're trying to do then is measure the spacecraft's velocity as a function of time very, very accurately. And we do that by measuring the Doppler shift of the radio signal. 
So if you've ever heard a, a, a fire engine going by with its siren, as it's approaching you, it's high pitch, and when it goes by, it goes, right? That Doppler shift, that change in pitch, tells you about the velocity of the fire engine relative to you. So the instrument that we use is sort of a combination of the listening on the ground to the radio signal and the radio signal transmitted by the spacecraft. So the biggest part of the instrument, of course, is a 34 meter diameter radio antenna at Goldstone, California. Then on the spacecraft, there's a high gain antenna that's pointed at the Earth. So the radio instrument measures the voltage coming in from the antenna from the Earth, and then it transmits a voltage that goes fed out to the radio signal to send back to the Earth. And then the gravity measurement tells us something about density variations, which then can tell us something about whether there's storms on the outside or whether they penetrate all the way through and whether there's some hint of, of a structure at the center other than just compressed gas of the hydrogen. JADE, the Jovian Auroral Dynamics Experiment, is a set of instruments that measures the electrons and ions. Those are particles, charged, very tiny charged particles that are parts of an atom. And those particles actually produce the aurora. They follow along the magnetic field lines and they come down into the atmosphere at Jupiter and they excite different sorts of interactions that, that emit light, different wavelengths of light. Those we observe as the aurora, but the aurora is really caused by these tiny, tiny particles coming down into the atmosphere. And Jade actually measures those individual particles. There are three identical electron sensors and they look off in three different directions around the, the belly band of the spacecraft so that they've got a broad field of view, 120 degrees wide, so the three of them actually can see all the way around the spacecraft all the time. The Jade Ion instrument is, is different. It actually has a thing that looks a little bit more like a hamster wheel and a hamster cage, and that's to allow particles to come in over 270 degrees of uh, observing angle, and twice per minute the Juno spacecraft spins around, and that allows that field of view to observe all of space. And so we're trying to understand what's the same and different between our own aurora and the aurora of Jupiter so that we can understand the processes really in detail for the first time. Uh, we'll be fully successful when we can come back and, and tell the world how it really works, what particles are involved and why. A Jupiter infrared aurora mapper is an image spectrometer. At the beginning it was meant for supporting aurora observations to make images of aurora, and at the same time, to look at the different, uh, uh, different view of the aurora. GIRAM is made of two pieces. One part of GIRAM is, is called the optical head, where it's the, the, the sensitive part of the instrument that can focus the images, like a camera. And uh, there is another box, which is the main electronic. And we can take images, in two different uh, wavelengths. One is devoted to the auroral observations, and uh, the other part of the detector, the imager, it's uh, sensitive to the thermal emission of the planet. So at the same time, we can take these two pictures that are superimposed, one above the other one, for observing the aurora if it's present. The reason why we are not uh, with all the other instruments, but we are on a side in the aft deck of the spacecraft, is because we entered the mission later. So there was no more room <laughs> in, the, in the big place, in the place where all the other instruments are. So we had to run quite fast to keep the pace with the mission. JunoCam is on the spacecraft to take pictures of Jupiter, and we specifically designed it to get pictures of the polar regions of Jupiter. We've had a number of spacecraft that have flown past Jupiter and taken pictures, taken movies, but they've always been in the equatorial plane. And so this mission is the first one that we really get up over the polar regions. Let me mention that all of our pictures are of the cloud tops. Jupiter is a ball of gas, and all we will see are clouds. But they're very interesting, very dynamic clouds, so it should be fun. JunoCam is a unique element of the payload on this spacecraft because from the outset, its reason for being on the payload was to do outreach to the public. We uh, do not have enough data volume to take a picture every, on every spin. 
we are going to have to be choosy and select what are the places that we want to take pictures of. We are going to invite the amateur astronomy community to send us their best data. So approximately a month away from when we take our data, we will be collecting the pictures from the amateur astronomy community and uh, talk about why they would take a picture in any given latitude. And so the whole theme is to do science in a fishbowl. Let's do what we would do, but let's do it in a public forum so that the public can participate. And I'll be very happy uh, if everybody gets involved the way I hope they do. Years ago, the magnetic field provided a, a reference for navigation on Earth. So for four or 500 years, whenever ships crossed the ocean, they carried compasses so they could find their way when, when you can't see stars or, or landmass. A magnetometer is like a fancy compass. It measures both the, the direction and the magnitude of the magnetic field. So in this case, we fly a magnetic sensor at the very outer extremity of the spacecraft. We're on what's called a magnetometer boom, which is about 12 feet in length. It's about twice as long as I am tall. The primary purpose uh, for our investigation is to map the magnetic field of Jupiter very accurately uh, and try to understand how it's generated deep down inside Jupiter uh, in Jupiter's uh, electrically conducting core. Uh, what we're going to do is, is make very, very accurate measurements uh, in orbit about Jupiter and, and basically envelop Jupiter in a net, a dense net of observations. And that'll give us the ability to image what the magnetic field looks like down in Jupiter's core where it's generated. NASA loves acronyms, and so I just simply abbreviated microwave radiometer as MWR. From its name, it's, 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 uh, it measures the radiation in the, in the microwave region. Now that sounds like you know, a lot of highfalutin uh, uh, scientific terms, but it's really uh, pretty simple. What we're actually doing is measuring the thermal radiation from the atmosphere of Jupiter beneath the clouds. And at every wavelength, we have six wavelengths on, on the instrument. Every wavelength is designed to look at a different region of the atmosphere, measure the thermal radiation coming up from, from, uh, from some different region in the atmosphere. And uh, by measuring them with the spacecraft, we'll be able to put that together into a picture, uh, you know, a, a three-dimensional picture of the atmosphere, atmospheric structure of Jupiter. What we've come up with um, as, as the most effective way to, to build an antenna is a big flat array that's about five feet square all the way around. It, it's as big as the side of a spacecraft, which is not a coincidence because we sort of sized the spacecraft to hold an antenna for our longest wavelength. Now, the other wavelengths are progressively smaller by factors of two at every step. So it turns out another side of the spacecraft can hold all of the rest. So we have no idea what we're going to see uh, because nobody's ever seen this region before. Uh, so um, it's, it's going to be a surprise to, to all of us when we, when we get, the, get the information back. So uh, you know, we expect to discover all sorts of new things. UVS stands for ultraviolet spectrograph. It's uh, an instrument that looks at ultraviolet light, light you can't see with your eyes. It, it's too short a wavelength, but it also breaks that light up into different colors, much like a prism would break up white light into a rainbow. It has two components to it, actually. One is the sensor, which is sort of a, a telescope plus a spectrograph side by side. And all the uh, electronics, except what need to be right at the sensor, are put in another box, which is deep inside a vault, which on uh, Juno protects all the sensitive electronics from the radiation at Jupiter. Jupiter has some similarity to Earth. It, it, uh, the Earth has uh, northern lights, auroras, and they're uh, spectacular to watch. Uh, Jupiter's auroras are like a thousand times bigger. So the auroral oval on Jupiter is bigger than the entire Earth and much, much more powerful. And it's always on, but it's much easier to look at it in ultraviolet wavelengths because we can see it on the day side as well. When we see light from those different colors in the UV, they tell us different things about Jupiter's upper atmosphere and the particles that are causing the auroras to happen. We'll be able to contrast how auroras work at Earth with how they work at Jupiter. 
and there are many differences we already know, but there's a lot of things we've never been able to see at Jupiter that we can see with Juno once we get there. The WAVES instrument is basically a radio. It tunes to frequencies all the way from 50 hertz, which is near the bottom of the audio frequency range, up to above 40 megahertz, which is above uh, the limit of the uh, radio emissions that Jupiter generates. The WAVES instrument has two sensors. Uh, one is designed to measure the electric field component of these waves, and it looks like a pair of rabbit ear antennas that you might have had on a TV when you were a kid, except these are about 10 feet long. The other sensor is a much smaller device. It's about 10 inches long, and it's basically a coil of wire. It has about 10,000 turns on it, and it's designed to measure the magnetic fluctuations of waves. So these two sensors are used by the receivers to study the various phenomenon, uh, particularly in Jupiter's polar magnetosphere. For example, the maximum frequency of the radio emissions that we detect told us what the magnetic field strength was in the magnetosphere of Jupiter long before any spacecraft arrived. Juno was designed to actually go to another planet and uh, make the first measurements of an extraterrestrial auroral region in great detail. So I think we learn about ourselves by studying other environments in the universe. On August 5, 2011, one of the world's most powerful rockets is set to take off. ATLO is an acronym. It stands for Assembly, Test, and Launch Operations. Basically, we'll assemble it, and we'll do all the system level testing, we'll do all the environmental testing, we'll do all the launch processing, and then we will go ahead and launch it. So in ATLO, um, you basically start with a bunch of pieces. We had what was known as the prop module. Um, that's the large base piece of, of the structure. On top of the prop module sits the vault. Uh, individual boxes, uh, flight computers, our power subsystem, all came in separate pieces. And, and in ATLO, our job is to take all those pieces and come up with a plan and strategy of putting them together in an organized manner that makes sense. We have a philosophy at Lockheed Martin to test as you fly. We have to try to replicate the environment that the spacecraft is going to see in space. So we basically trick it through another piece of software into thinking that it's flying. And so we run through all these scenarios, just like in flight, and we verify that it functionally does what it's supposed to do. So in order to accurately represent all different environments that the spacecraft is exposed to, we need to kind of um, break up the tests individually. One of the more exciting tests that we got to run on the spacecraft was the solar array deployment test. We have very large solar arrays on this spacecraft so that once we get to Jupiter, we have enough electricity to operate the spacecraft. In order to be able to them deploy them with low friction, we used a flat floor and a pneumatic device that's kind of like a hovercraft. A thermal vacuum test is probably the largest, most thorough, complete test that we'll do on a, a whole entire spacecraft assembly. So once we get the spacecraft fully assembled, we will put it in a large chamber that tries to replicate space. Also within the chamber is a shroud that is filled with liquid nitrogen, and it can get as cold as negative 180 degrees C. So we try to simulate what environment the spacecraft is going to experience in space. So we get through these major environmental milestones, verify that the spacecraft is working as we planned, take it out, verify that it functionally works after we do all the tests, then we prep it to ship down to the launch site. On launch day, of course, it's, it's a dream to have perfect weather, no clouds in the sky, but we have to do with what we have. There are weather rules in place, weather criteria that we cannot violate. There are rules for cumulus clouds. There are rules for anvil weather clouds. There are rules for lightning within the area, within 10 miles, within five nautical miles. 
Uh, so there are several weather rules in place. Atlas systems, propulsion, go. Hydraulics, go. Pneumatic, Making go. a list to get through a launch countdown is the only way to get through a launch. And even once my list is checked off, I, I still won't throw it away because I want to go back and double and triple check to make sure that I did everything on that list. As soon as we get the go-ahead from ULA, we will power up the spacecraft for the final time. We make our spacecraft dirt simple so that at the end, there's very few things to go wrong in this very critical time. So our spacecraft is a very easy spacecraft to launch. Juno gets to Jupiter by flying by the Earth. It gains momentum by passing the Earth at 500 kilometers altitude, and in doing so, it gets sucked into the Earth's gravity well. And what happens is that the trajectory which is on a path relative to the sun originally, um, now is flying by the Earth and is also influenced by the Earth's gravity field. It gets deflected out towards the planet Jupiter. The idea is that you can't get there directly unless you have a much bigger launch vehicle. When we get to Jupiter, we do a big maneuver called JOI. The Jupiter Orbit Insertion Maneuver is what actually puts us into an orbit about Jupiter so that we're captured by Jupiter's gravity. It needs to be a big maneuver because we're flying at this enormous velocity around the sun, and in order to be captured by even a big planet like Jupiter, we have to aid that capture by doing a big maneuver to slow us down. There's so little time to react that we have to let it do its own thing and just trust that the planning and the testing that went into that will do the right thing. We plan on actually listening in on the spacecraft as it does its Jupiter orbit insertion. And at the very end, we have it radio back to tell us, OK, we did all the right things. Here's how the spacecraft is doing. We survived. The Atlas V 551 rocket weighing 650 tons, launches and reaches a top speed of 4,500 miles per hour. The rocket hurdles through Earth's atmosphere, exhausting its fuel and reaching orbit in just over 10 minutes. The payload fairing falls away, revealing the Juno spacecraft within. Once in its proper orbit, the Centaur booster gives the probe its spin and sets Juno free on its journey to Jupiter.
great excitement about space exploration is it's a big public endeavor. Everybody's involved. There's some wonderful amateur astronomers who are uh, very knowledgeable about individual storms and clouds on Jupiter. I think the public involvement in these missions are really what makes it important and exciting and fun. If it was just us scientists looking down our own microscope, you know, it wouldn't be so much fun. The public will see how we make decisions and what we care about. They'll continue interest in science, they'll ask questions, they'll be curious. I think this is an important part for society to, to think about what's out there and how it works and how it all fits together. Not only do our capabilities complement each other, but uh, our enthusiasm infects each other, and it's a very good collaboration with the amateurs. I, as a 14-year-old, stayed up until 4 in the morning to watch the guys walk on the moon. And I expect there will be kids who will be following everything that's happening with Juno. It's a great privilege to be involved with something where the public are all actively interested. Yeah, it's fun. This is Atlas Launch Control. We are now two hours, 32 minutes, 32 seconds away from the liftoff of the Juno spacecraft aboard an Atlas V rocket. Liftoff is from Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral. The forecast is essentially unchanged from what we've been watching all week. There is just a 30% chance of not meeting the launch weather criteria. It takes everything we know to get off this planet. So while everything that NASA does and building the Juno spacecraft and exploring Jupiter is all high tech, I think a rocket launch represents the extreme of that edge. The energy in the room on launch day is stressful, but in a good way. It's a good feeling. It's, it's almost electric. Everybody's excited and nervous. And I've seen people before, you know, biting their nails. A rocket launch is one of the most amazing things to see. I mean, it's truly a cosmic event. So, ULA safety officer, go. Range weather and final clear to launch. Go. LC, LD, channel one. Go ahead. LC, you have permission to launch. Roger. A launch is probably our single biggest risk in the entire mission. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, two, one. Ignition and liftoff of the Atlas V with Juno on a trek to Jupiter, a planetary piece of the puzzle on the beginning of our solar system. When you see it, the first thing that you're impressed with is just the amount of energy. You feel it because the ground is shaking and you're miles away and the waves are coming through the ground like an earthquake would. Mark one. You're canceling gravity. Gravity's pulling you down. You've got to get to a certain speed and then that's the escape velocity to leave the Earth. Max Q. Boosters throttling up, we're on schedule. Engine response looks good. You're watching something going from one planet to another. And we have solids one, two, three, four, and five jettison. Visual indication that all solids have separated well. Current altitude is 45.8 miles. In altitude, downrange distance, 69 miles. Velocity, 5,413 miles per hour. And we have payload fairing jettison. And CFR jettison. We have retros and have spacecraft separation. This concludes the plus count commentary for the AV-29 Juno mission. After five years of being alone in space, Juno approaches Jupiter and begins reaching a top speed of 160,000 miles per hour, officially becoming the fastest man-made object 
in history. The main engine ignites to slow down the spacecraft, and Juno is captured by the powerful gravitational pull of Jupiter. Settling into the most challenging orbit ever attempted, Juno will come as close as 3,100 miles to the planet's cloud tops. Juno will continually duck below deadly radiation belts as it studies Jupiter in unprecedented detail for more than a year. Juno will use remote sensing to inspect Jupiter from its innermost core to the outer reaches of the magnetic bubble the giant planet inhabits. Juno will be the first probe to visit the regions above the poles of Jupiter, witnessing energies in the magnetosphere that create its extraordinary ultraviolet auroras. We communicate with the Juno spacecraft uh, with radio uh, waves and radio frequencies. But what we do is we send up commands or data to the spacecraft to tell it what to do. It in turn takes data and sends back what we call telemetry. The way that we find out if there's a problem on the spacecraft in space is uh, by monitoring our telemetry. And our spacecraft talks to us on Earth through the Deep Space Network. The Deep Space Network is a set of antenna that we use that are around the world in order to return data to us and to send commands up to the spacecraft. We've designed a lot of points on the spacecraft that tell us things like the state of charge of the battery and what temperature things are at. Can we look at that telemetry and monitor if the spacecraft is happy or sad and um, doing well or not? And we set limits on that so it will give us automatic alerts if something's wrong. And so on the ground we can look at it and make sure everything's okay and we can detect a problem that way. After orbiting Jupiter for over a year, the Juno craft will dive deep into the atmosphere and burn up. But the mission will never truly end. No matter how many answers we find, there will always be more questions. Our search for understanding and meaning continues. The primary way that we detect problems on the spacecraft is we make it smart enough to detect them on its own. So the spacecraft has a system called fault protection. It's constantly looking for um, how the spacecraft hardware is and software is operating. Is everything going per plan? Do we have anything that's not operating as expected? So if we're spinning and the spin rate gets out of control, a fault protection is looking at the spin rate and determining, OK, this level of spin is OK. And if it gets past this number, I'm not happy. And so if it gets to a number that it's not happy, it will take action. It actually will take care of it itself. And then after it's reconfigured or whatever, then it'll send down information and let us know that that's what's happened. Or if it, if it can't solve a problem or the problem is too large, it will put it in safe mode and basically say, OK, I'm just going to wait for the ground to help me because I'm Confused. Nothing should cause a, a further problem for the spacecraft. We shut down the instruments, we shut down other aspects of the spacecraft, and we make it kind of operate very simply at a very low data transfer level so that when the Earth picks it up, it's very apparent to us right away that it's had a problem, and we can then start fixing it right away. The spacecraft would continue to operate after it experiences a particular fault. One particular fault will not um, result in a total failure of the spacecraft. Our little spacecraft these days are very complicated and, and they're very smart. They know how to take care of themselves. An aurora, as we see it on Jupiter or on the Earth, is caused by charged particles, electrons or protons, crashing into the atmosphere. When those electrons come bombarding in, they excite the electrons inside the hydrogen atom, and UV light comes pouring out, and that's what produces most of the aurora on Jupiter. 
This is very similar to the northern lights of the Earth. It's the same physical process. Deep inside the planet, the hydrogen has been compressed so much that it loses its electrons and you have a conducting layer. So people call this metallic hydrogen. And it's in that conducting shell that we think Jupiter generates its magnetic field. Now, one of the interesting things is that it's carrying with it electrons and protons that are spiraling around as they crash into the atmosphere at the north and at the south. And when they do that, they create what we call an aurora because they're generating light. It's quite a spectacular sight if you can see this aurora going on. It's so bright that you don't have to be on the surface of the planet where this is happening. You can look at it from the outside. And Juno is equipped to look at the aurora on the north and south poles of Jupiter and to study it in a way that has never been possible before. The rings of Saturn are very well known. They're this gorgeous set of rings circling the planet. These rings are made of ice crystals, and that's one of the reasons that they're so bright and that they're so easily seen. It turns out that Jupiter also has rings, but these rings are made of dust, so they're hard to see. In fact, they were only discovered by the Voyager spacecraft. Before that, we didn't know that Jupiter had rings. They're caused by small satellites that Jupiter has moving around the planet close in. These satellites are releasing some dust from their surfaces, and that dust forms the rings. That's why they're so difficult to see from the Earth. When you get close up with the spacecraft, they're obviously easier to see. You might worry about Juno running into some of these rings as it makes its orbit, but it doesn't. The orbit is, is oriented in such a way that it will not pass through these rings. The reason we plan to crash Juno into Jupiter at the end of the mission is for what's called planetary protection. We can't make the spacecraft perfectly sterile. We try to keep it as clean as possible. We spend quite a bit of uh, effort, you know, dressing up in uh, bunny suits and putting in a clean room that's changing air as fast as we can do it and trying to keep it as clean as possible, but nothing's perfectly clean. The United States is part of an international treaty that says we will be sure not to contaminate other worlds that could potentially harbor life. There are some moons around Jupiter and, and Mars and other places that kind of look a little enough like Earth that we're thinking, well, maybe there is a, a life that we would recognize there. You would really hate to, 50 years from now, send a mission to, say, Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, and find life and then not be able to tell whether this is European life or contamination from Juno. So what we do is we dispose of Juno when we're done with it, and we let it burn up in Jupiter's atmosphere. There's about a 99% chance that what would eventually happen to it is it would crash into Jupiter, burn up, not contaminate anything but 99% chance isn't good enough for us. It isn't good enough for NASA. We need to show by agreement with NASA that we have a less than one chance in 10,000 of contaminating Europa. So while we still have control before the radiation has done any damage, we'll fire the rockets, we'll burn Juno up in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter, and that way we'll be certain we're not gonna contaminate anything. Jupiter has such a strong radiation environment that when we send all our sensors in to do their observations, there's a lot of challenges that have to be overcome to make sure that they can do that, particularly with noise. Uh, all the high energy electrons and protons in the environment uh, whiz through the instruments and create noise in the detectors and sensors. That kind of condition can be a catastrophic event for a device that can destroy it. Uh, so that's one of the radiation effects that has to be screened and understood when you're designing an instrument. Testing for the Jovian radiation environment on Earth is not easy. You have to go to a very high energetic electron facility, which is a very rare type of facility on Earth for this kind of testing. Um, it's not something that's commonly done. People don't do space missions to Jupiter very often, so there isn't a big customer base for that. Uh, we've ended up going to facilities and hospitals that treat cancer patients or other facilities that are used to simulate nuclear blasts for submarines. Uh, very unusual places in, in all different parts of the world in order to mimic the Jovian radiation environment. 
Right now we're looking at how we can understand what the environment is actually doing to our instruments while we're in flight. We've modeled it, we've tested, we have a good idea of what will happen. But we can understand from the instrument telemetry and the science return exactly what they're experiencing. If there are certain failures uh, or graceful degradations, that will be visible in that, in that data stream coming down. The very extreme radiation environment, very changing radiation environment, and other missions in the future will, will go to these locations and they will design based on what we'll be learning. The short answer for why Juno is solar powered rather than nuclear power is because we can. Um, at the time we did the proposal for Juno, uh, NASA had a, generally speaking, a policy that it's okay to use nuclear power to do things in space where you need to use nuclear power. But if you can do something simpler, like solar panels, you should. We decided it was probably less risky to advance the technology of solar cells to work at Jupiter than it was to invent uh, a new nuclear power source. We haven't taken solar panels that far before and run an entire spacecraft that far from the sun off of solar power. We had to work at a colder temperature, we had to work with less light, and we had to be able to work inside of a radiation environment so as things got damaged, you had to either protect them or make them more efficient. The biggest design challenge of the solar arrays was probably just their size. Each solar array is 28 feet long, and so we have three of them. And so when the solar arrays are fully deployed, the Juno spacecraft is almost 60 feet in diameter across the, uh, across the solar arrays. Getting those big solar panels to work the way we expect them to work and produce the amount of power we need, that's been a bit of a challenge. The solar arrays are pretty interesting. When we deploy them, they'll be generating about 12 kilowatts of, of power. As we get further and further from the sun, that amount of energy will drop off until we finally get to Jupiter where we're only generating 400 watts. It's not even enough to run a hairdryer. Generally, with space exploration, you're pushing the envelope of technology. Solar panels have improved a bit. The instruments have improved a bit and can run on less power. And I think it's turned out to be a very good decision for Juno. The design of Juno and the science measurements that we wanted to make were all taken into consideration at once when we were trying to figure out how to, how to do this the most efficient way. So Juno has three solar arrays that stick out. It could have had four or five or any number. We looked for something that was efficient and could be packaged inside of a rocket. That was one of the first requirements. We also wanted to carefully make it so that the science instruments could look out between the solar rays. We knew we were going to have to see a certain, what's called a field of view. I wanted to be able to look up and down the magnetic field lines as we flew over Jupiter so I could see the particles that were creating the aurora. When we come off of the launch vehicle, we're spinning at about 1.4 RPM. When we um, do our, uh, our burns, we spin up to about 5 RPM to give us a little more stabilization. And when we're going around the planet, we're spinning at about 2 RPM. Juno spins like a propeller, uh, where the propeller's kind of facing the sun because they're all solar powered, and we want to have each of the instruments to be able to look out between the solar arrays and see Jupiter or wherever they, they need to look in order to do their science objectives. There's two basic reasons why we want to have a rotating spacecraft. One is really simple. It's just stable that way. If you spin something, it stays spinning. It's like a gyroscope. We call it a simple spinner, a spinning spacecraft. The other reason is we can use a spinning spacecraft to let each instrument get its turn to see Jupiter. If I had only one sensor looking in one direction, because I was spinning twice a minute, you'd think I'd be able to look in all directions every, uh, every half a minute. But I'm moving so fast going over Jupiter that in fact I'm going to pass the field lines that are making the aurora and I might only be looking up or only looking down or looking sideways by mistake. And so by putting three sensors around, looking all the time between the solar arrays, we ensure that no matter how fast we go across, we're looking in the right direction to make our measurements. But 
once the whole spacecraft gets put together, it's important for us to operate it in a flight-like way. So we enact a policy on our missions here at JPL called Test As You Fly. We say, okay, we're going to pretend that we're launching the spacecraft today, and we set the universe simulator in the clean room to pretend it's launch day. Juno has a very complex instrument suite. The instruments are tested both individually at their home institutions as well as part of the flight system on the path towards launch. We try to replicate both the conditions, the timing, the personnel, the procedures, the products, the hardware, everything, uh, similar to what we would have actually in space when we're flying. We will go through um, acoustic energy testing to make sure that the instruments will be able to withstand the launch environment. We'll go through a thermal vac test where we'll simulate being in a vacuum in space. We pretend to fly the mission on the ground and then we make sure we understand the differences between the environment we have on the ground and the environment we have in space. It's a blast to march through that testing suite and make sure that you've thought of all the contingencies and, and tried to break it and make sure it's going to do what it needs to do. The interior of Jupiter is a tough problem for us. To get deep inside, we have to use indirect methods. We can't go there. We think that Jupiter has a core, but we don't know for sure. It is nonetheless likely to be perhaps 10 times the mass of the Earth. It may not be solid, it's very hot. The pressure is too great, the temperature is too high, it's just too far in, we can't get there. So what we have to do is to use radiation that's coming to us from those lower depths to tell us what's going on down there. And this is where Juno comes in. Juno is exciting because we will learn such a wide range of things. For indeed, Jupiter is the most massive planet in the solar system. It is the body you want to understand in order to understand the architecture of everything else, including Earth. What is the proportion of water on Jupiter? compared to the amount of hydrogen on Jupiter, and how does that compare with the proportion of hydrogen to water in interstellar space and in the sun? That's a very important question, and that's one of the things that Juno is going to address directly. I would expect Juno to tell us more about how planets work, meaning how the heat gets out, what kinds of flows exist inside the body, how magnetic fields get generated, learning what Jupiter is made of, and learning about how it works, uh, those to me are what make the Juno mission exciting. One of the most exciting aspects of weather is a thunderstorm. So what happens on Jupiter? We know that lightning occurs on Jupiter. The Galileo orbiter made images of lightning on the night side of Jupiter. And these lightning bolts are hundreds of times more powerful than lightning on the Earth. In a way, this is surprising because Jupiter gets less sunlight, less energy from the sun than the Earth does because it's much farther from the sun. With Juno, we want to understand the structure of these thunderstorms. We want to understand where these um, parcels begin to rise, how much water is in them, how they're organized, are they larger than terrestrial thunderstorms, and why it actually has thunderstorms and super lightning. Um, Juno will be able to tell us that. When I was younger, I was always fascinated by astronomy, and I can remember just looking up in space and uh, looking out at the stars out there, wondering what was out there. I, I actually wanted to be an aerospace engineer even when I was a little girl. I really liked math, and I liked, you know, space and astronauts, and I would write letters to the NASA centers and get pictures and stuff. I had posters in my bedroom of, of Jupiter and Neptune and Saturn. I thought, I thought they were just amazing. As a little kid, Jupiter was my planet. I would look out there, and you couldn't touch it. You couldn't learn about it enough because you couldn't get there. And so I always had this yearning to want to reach out. And when people would ask me, what do you want to do when you grow up? Um, I, thought, I said, I want to work on spaceships. I really wanted to work on rockets and, and build things that would go into space. And it's just really exciting to have a chance to, to do something that I, I really wanted to do when I was a little kid. For whatever reason, I got lucky and I'm the head of Juno and I'm reaching out. And of course, I, I could never have done it myself. It's only through everybody reaching together that we can reach it all. It started out on the back of an envelope 
as many things do. It's amazing being able to see it, a vague notion that you have in your brain turn into a real piece of hardware that is going to fly all the way to Jupiter. So Juno is really a, an incredible international mission. It's a very large mission, involves people from many, many different countries, scientists, engineers, administrative people, technicians, uh, people who do purchasing. I mean, it's amazing how many people in different walks of life have to be involved in making a mission like this happen. It's a big public endeavor. Everybody's involved. We really have the A-team here, and it's amazing that when you get that kind of atmosphere and that kind of collaboration and synergy, how that can just make the whole thing, even the hardest problem, that much more palatable. We check our egos at the door, we roll our sleeves up, and then we just dive in and work whatever needs to be worked. I think that it's a tremendous experience to be involved in something where we can learn about how planets formed. We uh, ask, uh, why are we here? Uh, where do we come from? Jupiter is the place to go to understand our origins, how the solar system formed, how the Earth got its water and organic molecules, and whether we are a typical planetary system in the cosmos. You get to open a door that's never been opened by a human before. You're sending something to some place where few things have ever gone. When you work on a project like Juno, which is really exciting, and there's a lot riding on it, a lot of people working on something that takes a long time to prepare, there's an opportunity to be really anxious. There's an opportunity to be really excited. You can worry about all kinds of things. In a way, it's like having a child. Uh, you rear this child uh, throughout the years, and then all of a sudden, they take off on their own, and they become independent. It feels a little like a, an unruly teenager uh, that I'm ready to get out of the house. Some of those cameras really do feel like my babies that I've been working on for such a long time. It's, it's going to be uh, really wonderful. We developed the design for the spacecraft. We put it together and we let it fly. There's nothing like uh, listening to that launch vehicle take off and watching something that you built and put, poured a lot of time and energy into leave the planet. You know that the, the whole team's done everything they can uh, to ensure mission success, yeah, but yeah, there are no guarantees. So I think pretty much everybody holds their breath and, and just waits. I think it's starting to hit all of us how close we are and this is really gonna happen. I'm excited to um, to see this thing go and shake people's hands and walk away proud of working this mission. I don't know what else in life that you could do that will be so exciting and so different all the time and again, have such job satisfaction. It's very rare to see a team that knows how to work together the way that this team does. It's uh, quite a privilege and honor to be able to perform in this role. This is certainly the best job I've, I've ever had, and I, I love it. It's just, it's such a fun job, and it's really a wonderful, a wonderful way to make the world seem even bigger than it is. In Roman mythology, which of course is rooted from Greek mythology, Juno was the uh, wife and sister uh, goddess of Jupiter, or in Greek it was Zeus, and the uh, Greek name for Juno was Hera. So they were companions, and Zeus of course was the king of the gods, and she was the queen of the gods, Juno. She was married and uh, cared a lot about children and marriage and keeping everybody uh, well behaved and sort of like a good mother would. And Zeus was uh, sort of being naughty with some friends and doing things and he saw Juno looking down at him or starting to come close to him. So he cast a veil of clouds around himself and his friends and tried to hide his uh, naughtiness. But of course, Juno was a, was a fairly powerful god herself, and she saw enough that she said, okay, I'm suspicious, and kind of traveled down and used her powers to look right through the clouds and see the true nature of Jupiter and understand what he was really up to. And that's exactly what the Juno spacecraft does for us, is that it goes there with special instruments in a special orbit and uses its magical powers to see right through Jupiter's clouds and understand its true nature, which is, holding these secrets for us about how uh, the solar system formed and where we all came from. Jupiter's by far the largest planet in the solar system. It has an influence on everything else. So if we want to understand how do planets form, how do solar systems form, we really have to start with Jupiter. By studying Jupiter, you're going to get 
one piece of the puzzle, um, not necessarily how life formed, but maybe how the ingredients that made up life eventually got spread around in the early solar system and got to us. We care about the light elements because that's what we're made out of. We've got a puzzle about where these volatile elements, these lightweight elements like nitrogen, carbon, noble gases, uh, where they came from. To determine how much water is in Jupiter is essential to understand how this planet came to form and uh, then how it influenced the formation of all the, the other planets in the system. When the Earth formed, in the absence of Jupiter, it probably would have gathered very little water and organic molecules, which would have been concentrated in the colder outer part of the solar system. What Jupiter evidently did as it formed was to scatter cold material that contained water ice and organic materials to the inner solar system where it could be captured by the Earth and the other terrestrial planets. We learn about the origin of the solar system, we're learning about our own origins, we're learning about how life comes to be, about who we are and what our place is in the universe. It's about knowledge and about humanity's quest to understand. For me, that's why we need to study Jupiter and the solar system and almost everything. Jupiter is 1,300 times the volume of Earth more than twice the mass of all the other planets combined. The fifth planet from the Sun and the largest planet in our solar system. Because of its enormous size and powerful gravity, it is believed that Jupiter has influenced the formation and evolution of the other bodies that orbit our Sun. Unlike Earth and the other smaller planets, the composition of Jupiter has remained unchanged since the solar system began Like a time capsule, Jupiter can help us reconstruct nearly five billion years of history. The scariest thing to me about Juno are the unknowns. So much about the environment that we'll have to withstand is unknown. Nothing's really certain about what's going to happen. It's a monster. It's unforgiving. It's relentless. It's spinning around so fast, it's gravity. It's like a giant slingshot, slinging rocks, dust, electrons, whole comets. Anything that gets close to it becomes its weapon. It just so happens, deep inside this body are the secrets we're after. Secrets about our early solar system. biggest and baddest planet in the solar system and it's got the biggest and baddest radiation and the biggest and baddest magnetic field. The background radiation that we're exposed to on Earth is about a third of a rad. What we expect to see at Jupiter is about 20 million rad. No spacecraft has ever flown this close to Jupiter, flown this deep into the radiation belts. So the real trick is, we gotta go in close, get the data, and get out. And the first time we go in, that's the most dangerous. We call it Jupiter Orbit Insertion, J-O-I. Nothing's really certain about what's going to happen. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition and liftoff of the Atlas V with Juno on a trek to Jupiter, a planetary piece of the puzzle on the beginning of our solar system. Picture our roll program is in progress. Vehicle body rates look good. Mr. P.U. has gone to fix the 
Three chamber pressures have plateaued. I'm rolling off. Signatures look good. RD-180 operation looks excellent at this point. Flight. Mach 1. SRB chambers continue to roll off. Max Q. Boosters throttling up for an schedule. Engine response looks good. Booster view is gone to closed loop control. Looking for our SRB throttle down momentarily. Engine continues to operate well. And booster has throttled back. Looking for SRB burnout soon. Chamber pressures have plateaued on the SRBs. And we begin to roll off. And Boda has been satisfied. Vehicle is starting back up to full thrust. And we have solids 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 jettisoned. Visual indication that all solids have separated well. And the booster has begun its roll for spacecraft thermal constraints. Rates look good. Bus and battery voltages are stable. And the vehicle has now gone into closed loop steering. And booster PU is also in closed loop control. Engine response looks good for the set mixed ratio. Current altitude is 45.8 miles in altitude, downrange distance 69 miles, velocity 5,413 miles per hour. Coming up on our RCS pyro valve activation, it is now fired. Systems now pressurizing the flight levels. We've begun our 2.5G throttle segment. Engine response looks good. Current altitude is 60 miles in altitude, downrange distance 118 miles. Velocity is 6,983 miles per hour. Coming up on our next mark event will be payload frame jettison followed by the CFR jettison. And we have payload frame jettison and CFR jettison. Boosters throttle back up to full thrust. Engine response looks good. Now accelerating at 4.7 Gs as we work our way to our 5G throttle segment. Boost space cooldown is underway. Now throttling to maintain 5 Gs. Pogo pyro vent has been fired. And have begun throttling to 4.6 Gs in preparation for BECO. Boost phase cooldown is complete. We have BECO. Engine shutdown looks good. We have retros and stage separation. We have locks and fuel pre-start. RCS GN2 purge fern is underway. We have ignition and full thrust on the RL-10. Centaur closed loop steering has been enabled. Small body rates associated with closed loop steering. Vehicle tank pressures are being ramped down as expected. Centaur PU has been commanded to oxidize the rich fixed angles for the early part of this six minute and two second burn.
Current altitude is 112 miles. Downrange distance is 589 miles. Velocity is 14,318 miles per hour. Range track shows the vehicle right down the middle of the corridor, making excellent progress. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes on the window. Are you getting a TV picture now, Houston? Neil, yes, we are getting a TV picture. You're in our field with you now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. The scariest thing to me about Juno are the unknowns. So much about the environment that we'll have to withstand is unknown. Nothing's really certain about what's going to happen. It's a monster. It's unforgiving. It's relentless. It's spinning around so fast, it's gravity. It's like a giant slingshot, slinging rocks, dust, electrons, whole comets. Anything that gets close to it becomes its weapon. It just so happens, deep inside this body are the secrets we're after. Secrets about our early solar system. biggest and baddest planet in the solar system and it's got the biggest and baddest radiation and the biggest and baddest magnetic field. The background radiation that we're exposed to on Earth is about a third of a rad. What we expect to see at Jupiter is about 20 million rad. No spacecraft has ever flown this close to Jupiter, flown this deep into the radiation belts. So the real trick is, we gotta go in close, get the data, and get out. And the first time we go in, that's the most dangerous. We call it Jupiter Orbit Insertion. J-O-I. Nothing's really certain about what's going to happen. Good evening from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. It is the 4th of July, Independence Day here in the U.S., and the day NASA hopes to make history with Mission Juno. The goal, to get to the biggest, baddest planet in the solar system, Jupiter. Here's what it looked like on approach just a few days ago, taken from its very own Juno cam. You can see the Galilean moons Callisto, Ganymede, Europa and Io. And tonight, Juno is poised to fly within 2,800 miles or 4,500 kilometers right over Jupiter's cloud tops. Hello, I'm Gay Yi Hill. We are in JPL's mission control for this critical event. This is the home of the Deep Space Network, the communications link with spacecraft all over the solar system and beyond. Now, just a few feet from me is the JPL mission support area where lead mission planner Stuart Stevens is standing by with part of the team. The rest of the team is at Lockheed Martin in Denver. Lockheed is our partner in this mission and Juno Deputy Chief Engineer Tracy Drain is there tonight. And as I said, this is a critical engineering event, which is why Stuart and Tracy will be giving us play-by-play -play coverage of tonight's maneuver. Plus, we have cameras in the science team area and the auditorium where hundreds of friends and family have gathered to watch this historic event. All right, let's begin with Stuart. Um, and we need to kind of fill in people exactly what this maneuver is all about. Stuart, can you tell them what is orbit insertion? And I understand the spacecraft has already started. Hi, Gay. Uh, yeah, this is Stuart Stevens. Uh, we're starting uh, already to make this turn from our slightly off sun-pointed attitude 
to uh, an attitude that'll put us in the right position to do the JOI burn. JOI is Jupiter orbit insertion, so we're going to burn our main engine to get into orbit um, in about an hour, and we're going to um, turn to that attitude. We're in the process of doing that right now. We've already confirmed that that's on its way, so we're happy everything's going well so far. Now, Stu, I understand we have animation to show folks that yes. will help them go through the paces and see exactly what's going on. Uh, right. Go ahead and show the animation. Uh, I'm not sure I have it here in front of me. But um, what we're seeing is, first we're turning, uh, we're oriented towards the sun and towards the earth, which is why the main antenna at the top is illuminated, but then we're turning to an attitude that puts us so that the main engine on the bottom end of the spacecraft can burn to slower velocity and put us into orbit at the right time. Uh, we also, before we um, do the burn, we uh, fire our thrusters to slow ourselves down uh, as we're rotating. Then we perform the burn. It lasts for about 35 minutes. Once it's over, we fire our thrusters again to get us back into uh, two RPM, two revolutions per minute, and then we go back to the regular uh, attitude. So that is what is going to take place later tonight. Okay. Now let's check in with Tracy Drain at Lockheed Martin. Tracy, can you explain to folks why we have two mission support areas here? Yes, I can. Um, you, people might think it's a little bit weird that we have two MSAs, but JPL worked very closely with Lockheed Martin in developing the Juno mission. JPL manages the mission, and we do key roles like mission management and navigation from there. Lockheed Martin built the spacecraft and pre-launched during a period called ATLO, which is assembly, test, launch operations. All of those huge pieces of equipment you'll see later tonight about Juno spacecraft came together with the vaults, the electronics vault that you'll be hearing more about, the large solar arrays. They were all assembled here and then put through a battery of environmental tests to make sure the spacecraft would be able to handle everything it's going to see in cruise and once we get to Jupiter, getting into orbit and going through all of our science phase. So if you were to look around the MSA here, you'll see that the subsystem experts are located here at Lockheed Martin from thermal, power, fault protection, flight software, telecom, um, GNC. We're going to be talking to a couple of those subsystem engineers later tonight. We like to have two fully staffed mission support areas because if you have some kind of connectivity issue either at JPL or here at Lockheed Martin, we'll still be able to monitor the spacecraft from either location. We actually sent a couple of JPL engineers out here to Lockheed Martin, myself, a TONES engineer and a navigation engineer, and several engineers from Lockheed Martin to JPL, those that are most critical in our Jupiter orbit insertion events like um, propulsion, guidance navigation and control, a systems engineer, and an ace. And what you'll notice if you look around, everyone's wearing the same color shirt. That is kind of one of the reasons you can see that we're all one team, all working together. If both MSAs stay up, we'll both be in communication with each other, following along as our vehicle goes through this um, huge event to get captured into orbit around Jupiter. All right, thanks Tracy. Okay, the key times tonight to focus on are the start of the main engine burn, that'll be about 8.18 p.m. Pacific time, 11.18 Eastern, and then the end of the burn, about 35 minutes later, that's around 8.53 Pacific, 11.53 Eastern. All of these times are Earth-received times. A timeline of these spacecraft events will be on display throughout the show. However, these are mission projected times. The actual times could vary when executed by the spacecraft. And some other info that could come in handy tonight. If you have to leave home to go to a barbecue or see fireworks tonight, no worries. You can continue watching on your mobile device. You'll find the links by going to twitter.com slash NASA Juno or Facebook.com slash NASA Juno. And please feel free to ask questions by using hashtag Ask NASA. Now let's go back to Stuart to get an update. I understand the spacecraft, spacecraft should be swapping antennas soon. Is that right? That's right. We're expecting to go from the main antenna um, that you saw at the top of the spacecraft. It's actually the medium gain antenna located at the top next to the main antenna to a different antenna at the end of this turn. When we get to the end of the turn, we'll be oriented in such a way that we'll 
need to use a different antenna on the spacecraft. We started out pointed towards the Earth like this, using the main antenna, and then we swapped to the medium gain antenna located nearby. We're performing this turn now to go to an attitude that's more like this, and we're going to perform that burn very close to Jupiter, where you see here, um, very close to the cloud tops. Um, and we're going to use an antenna at the bottom of the spacecraft to do that. It'll be pointed towards the Earth, but we'll get a very low data rate out of it. Um, and we'll be able to get something we call tones that tell us when events have transpired and know what's going on that way. We'll also get another type of signal called Doppler from the main radio transmission from the spacecraft, which I'll tell you more about later. Stuart, can you explain to us why it's necessary to swap antennas and what's the difference between these two antennas? Sure. The main antenna at the top, the high gain antenna, or even the medium gain antenna that we were using a short while ago, um, they allow us to get a larger data rate and to transmit telemetry, in, in other words, to get more detailed information down from the spacecraft. It's more like using your flashlight, for example, to illuminate a wall, and you get a very narrow beam, and it's a high gain in that sense. What we're doing in the case of this lower gain antenna that we're about to swap to is to use a something more like a light bulb that lets us illuminate all around 360 degrees and transmit less light at any given location. And because of that, we can still get a signal, but we do it with a very low signal strength and we get these tones that tell us only that a certain milestone has passed. So it's useful information, but it's less than our regular information. So if I have this correct, the fact that you're on a low gain antenna means that you have less information, l less data, so you won't be able to know a lot about the spacecraft, just that it did what you wanted it to do? That's right. Um, we'll be able to tell that, for example, a turn started or a turn ended, that we were able to start damping the nutation or the wobble of the spacecraft that occurs naturally after a turn when we're doing that with a spinning spacecraft. Um, and when that nutation damping ends, we're also going to do a spin up that I told you about in the video and a spin down that will be indicated by tones. And when the burn starts, we'll get a tone. Now, we won't get any tones if everything goes well until the very end of the burn, but then we'll get a tone at that, end, at that time as well. So I understand that the antenna swap is going to happen any time now, so we're going to stand by and listen to the MSA. That's right, and I believe we just heard that tone announced on our broadcast here in the mission support area for the swap to the toroidal low gain antenna. It was actually a tone that we weren't sure we would receive because it's happening in the middle of this large turn that I was telling you about, um, but we did in fact receive it. And so we know that not only have we swapped, but we're in the middle of that turn and we're continuing to get this other signal called Doppler that we'll tell you more about a little later. All right, and let's talk about how we receive that information. Mm -hmm. We receive it through the antenna, through the deep space network. Um, which of the stations will be listening this time out of all the different stations of the deep space network? Sure, we have to send that signal from the antenna on the spacecraft to an antenna on the ground, of course, and so we use antennas located all around the Earth we space them evenly around the Earth, and we call this the deep space network. Currently, we're receiving the signal at stations, stations in the California the desert the see the called indicating Goldstone. The transition to we're idle actually mode using and multiple antennas damping. to receive that signal. And so we receive the signal um, at five different stations in order to boost the signal and make sure that we get the tones and also for some redundancy. Now, a little later, we'll also be getting um, signal at Canberra. In fact, I think we are doing that already. We're overlapping with the Canberra station, and that's in Australia, uh, so that both Australia and the California desert can see Juno on their sky right now. All right. While you were telling that, Stuart, um, we did hear a call on the VOCA. Do you know what that call was? I believe that was for nutation damping, which follows the uh, end of the turn. So we got a two tones actually, one for the guidance navigation and control mode to idle, which signals the end of the 
procession or turn that we were involved in. And then another one for the start of the nutation damping, the wobble damping that occurs afterwards. We're performing a big turn on a spinning spacecraft, so there's naturally a little bit of wobble that occurs after that, and we're actively damping that with our thrusters. We'll get another tone in a couple minutes that will signal the end of the nutation damping. So we're basically getting into position then. Right. Everything so far has been happening pretty much right on schedule. We're, we couldn't be happier I'll with it, the progress of things so far. Damping has completed and we see the tone for the three pulse procession. So it sounds like the procession is complete and damping is complete and we're in position. Is that right? That's right. We just get that tone and uh, in fact we get another tone indicating another procession or turn that's actually a cleanup turn, uh, three pulse procession. Excellent. That will put us in, into even better position for the JOI burn. Oh, that's excellent. Thanks, Stuart. Sure, no problem. Well, Juno's instruments and camera were turned off five days ago to protect them during this maneuver. That means there will be no new pictures tonight. But we do have an interactive visualization that you can load onto your computer and virtually ride along with the Juno spacecraft as it arrives at Jupiter. Now, this computer simulation uses the mission's predicted data. It's called eyes on the solar system. Kevin Hussey is the manager of the JPL Visualization Technology Applications and Development Group, and he's going to demonstrate. Kevin? Thank you, Gay. The first thing you need to do is find the application and install it. So this video is going to show you how to do that. Okay, please note that this software runs on Windows and Macintosh operating system computers. Now, we're going to go ahead and hit the Explore button. I'm going to take you quickly and introduce this module to you. This is Eyes on Juno, if you will, and it's a real-time interactive view kind of over the shoulder of the spacecraft looking at whatever it is you choose to look at. For example, all I need to do is click and drag and I can spin around the spacecraft and in any of our eyes products anything with a label has you can click on it and you can fly there so I'm finding Io at the bottom of the screen I'm going to double click on Io now we are at Jupiter's moon Io and we'll be looking back at Jupiter there shortly you can see Juno coming over the North Pole so these are a couple of eyes basics along the top you have the different chapters in the software. For example, right now we're on the home screen. You can go to the mission screen. You can go to Juno orbit insertion, as well as a science chapter and one about the spacecraft. But I've already got a lot of mail about controls. For example, can we show the units in the metric system? Yes, you can. You go to the control panel and you click on the ruler and it will toggle between the metric system and Imperial. Let's take a look at the mission module. So when we click on this, we are able to look at the different either mission phases or mission events. Let's take a look at a mission event. The Earth flyby, you can see it's on the list here. So if I click Earth flyby, I'm going to be able to see this from two perspectives. In the picture in picture, you're going to see a view over the shoulder of Juno, seeing how the Earth would appear. And in the screen to the left, I'm scrolling in, and you can watch Jupiter as it slingshots past the Earth and heads out toward Jupiter. Now, if you look down at the bottom left of the screen, you have the time. This was October 9th, 2013. All right, so you get an idea. You can go back in time. You can go forward in time. I'm going to move us now to the time or the chapter about Juno orbit insertion. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click 
click Home, and then I'm going to click Juno Orbit Insertion. And now we have a special features here that allow you to do several things. You can turn on artistic renditions of scientific model output. For example, here's a model of the radiation fields of Jupiter. I'm going to turn on the aurora and turn on its magnetic field. Again, these are just visualizations of a scientific model. And you can turn those on and off at will. I'm going to clear those, and I'm going to show you what it would look like if we swung around and looked at this from the perspective of Io once again. So I'm looking for Io. There it is in the field of view. I click on it, take you to Io. I'll look back at Jupiter. I'll close this. And as you'll be able to see, there's Jupiter, excuse me, there's Juno coming over the north pole of Jupiter as we stand now. So these are just a couple of the things you can do with the Eyes on the Solar System Juno module. We hope that you will try this at home. It's rather simple and it allows you to do what you'd like to do within the context of the Jovian system. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Kevin. We are also using eyes in our coverage tonight. And just like us, you can use this module dedicated to Juno on your own computer by going to eyes.nasa.gov. Some data. Could you check on that? And let's check back with Stuart right now to see what's going on. Sure, Gay. Uh, it sounds like we already received our tone for the start of the spin up to five revolutions per minute. This is the spin up that I was telling you about earlier that takes us from two revolutions per minute, our normal spin rate, to five RPM, which is what we're going to use to be a little bit more stable for our JOI burn. So we're already in the right attitude. Now we're going to spin up to five RPM and be at the right spin rate. And then there's just a couple of other little things to do before we start the burn. So everything is looking good. Um, there's some time variability naturally built in to the sequence of events on the spacecraft. And these things happened pretty much as we expected within that amount of variability we were seeing. We have some yeah, animation the of the spin-up. Can you explain why it's so necessary to increase the spin rate? Sure. Um, if you look at the thrusters that are burning right now, they're causing the spin rate to increase from 2 RPM to 5 RPM. Basically what you get is it's like a bicycle wheel. The faster you spin it, the more stable it is. So for a large spinning spacecraft with a lot of mass at the end of the arrays and also in the solar arrays themselves, it's just more stable when we're at five revolutions per minute and when we're going to do this burn that wobbles us just a little bit, it'll help to keep us stable and on the right attitude, the right pointing during the burn and by the end of the burn. And when you're firing the engine, you need it to be more stable, I imagine, then? Um, a little bit, yeah. And, and it, it helps if we weren't exactly at 5 RPM, we'd still be okay. But we are confident from what we heard that we started the spin up to 5 RPM and shortly we'll be getting a tone that tells us we're at the end of that spin up. All right, so we'll be standing by.
All stations on June Accord. At this time, we see the tone for idle mode, indicating the spinach is complete. All right, we hear that the spin-up is complete. Can you explain what that means, Stuart? Sure. Like I was telling you a minute ago, what System. we got is a tone that tells us Go that the spin-up from 2 RPM yeah, the, uh, to 5 RPM has ended. And we're seeing that reflected in another signal that we have also right called a Doppler. And I can tell you a little bit more about that if you like. Thanks for the confirmation. We hear a and confirmation. And at this time, we do expect no further tones until two minutes before the burn begins. All right, so we will not be getting any more tones until two minutes before the burn begins. Well, joining us now is Richard Cook. He is JPL's Acting Director of Solar System Exploration. And as we mentioned earlier in the news conferences, big concern is the radiation, dust, particles. All these things could be fatal for the spacecraft. This sounds like an extremely risky endeavor here. That's right. I mean, the, Jupiter is the king of the planets, and it's certainly the most dangerous environment that we s will send a spacecraft into. It, it has very high radiation, strong magnetic field, and so the spacecraft is really now entering the phase or the part of its voyage that we worry about the most. Uh, as I understand, I mean, the team has prepared as much as it possibly can, but the thing that they can't anticipate is whatever Jupiter throws at them. That's right. There, although there are some things we have done in terms of the design of the spacecraft. In particular, uh, because it's so far away, we really can't joystick it. We can't okay. control it you know, directly. We have to basically program it ahead of time to tell it what to do. And so a lot of what you're hearing is the spacecraft essentially doing exactly what we told it. That's a good thing. In addition to that, though, we, make, we provide protection in, the, in software so that if something goes wrong and the spacecraft, for example, the computer resets because it gets hit by a radi piece of radiation, it will restart the, the sequence of events. And so once the burn starts, actually all of the activities that it's doing now, if for some reason it gets interrupted, it will retry and it will keep retrying that until it gets it finishes it. And how would that affect things if that should occur today, if it gets hit by radiation or a dust particle and it, it decides to stop down, it'll just restart? It will. It'll take a little time. Um, depends on what happens exactly, but usually the software uh, restarts just like on your home computer when something goes wrong. You start it up again and it takes a little while to get going again. So it's and a it, reboot. That's right. Okay. And then it figures out where it is and starts up again after a little bit of time. And so it may delay things, okay. uh, but it'll still occur in time to get us in orbit around Jupiter. And so much of what we're doing tonight is keeping an eye on the timeline and seeing that things occur at a particular time. If there is a re reboot, what would happen in terms of our timeline? It, depending on which scenario it is, it could be it anywhere from just a few seconds to more like 10 minutes where it would, by the time it comes back up, once it's firing the engines, if it, if it is interrupted at that point, it basically waits for about eight and a half minutes and then it starts up again and tries to continue burning the, the main engine. So if we see a change in timing, the, the team's not worried? No, no, I mean, it, it's, as I said, we're so, we are worried about this particular phase of the mission, and so we build in all these protections that allow us to, to recover from problems. All right. So it looks like so far. So far, it's going great. Very right. excited about what we're seeing. All right. Thank you, Richard You're Cook. Welcome. And this is live coverage of Juno's arrival at Jupiter on NASA TV and the web. Tonight is what they call a critical event because it's a do or die moment. If the spacecraft is not safely placed into orbit around Jupiter, the mission is lost. And for those of you just joining us, here's a look at what this spacecraft is about to encounter. The scariest thing to me about Juno are the unknowns. So much about the environment that we'll have to withstand is unknown. Nothing's really certain about what's going to happen. It's a monster. It's unforgiving. It's relentless. It's spinning around so fast, it's gravity. It's like a giant slingshot, slinging rocks, dust, electrons, 
whole comets, anything that gets close to it becomes its weapon. It just so happens, deep inside this body are the secrets we're after. Secrets about our early solar system. It's the biggest and baddest planet in the solar system and it's got the biggest and baddest radiation and the biggest and baddest magnetic field. The background radiation that we're exposed to on Earth is about a third of a rad. What we expect to see at Jupiter is about 20 million rad. No spacecraft has ever flown this close to Jupiter, flown this deep into the radiation belts. So the real trick is we gotta go in close, get the data, and get out. And the first time we go in, that's the most dangerous. We call it Jupiter Orbit Insertion, J-O-I. Nothing's really certain about what's going to happen. And it's a minute past the hour. We are not too far off from the start of the main engine burn. That takes place at 8.18 Pacific time. The engine will burn for 35 minutes to slow the spacecraft by about 1,200 miles per hour, 540 meters per second. So it can be captured into the desired orbit, which is a 53-day orbit around Jupiter. Right now, let's check in with Tracy Drain with the team at Lockheed Martin. Tracy, how is the spacecraft doing over there? Hi, Gay. The spacecraft is doing just great. We recently heard that we got spun up to five revolutions per minute, just as we expected. And right now, I'm here with Kristen Francis, who is our guidance, navigation, and control lead out here on the team in Lockheed Martin. So, Kristen, why don't you tell us a little bit about what a guidance, navigation, and control engineer does on a mission like Juno? Sure. So, as a a guidance navigation and control engineer, I'm primarily focused with attitude determination and attitude control. By attitude determination, I just mean where the spacecraft is pointed in space and how it knows where it's pointed. So unlike here on Earth, where we have a compass or GPS to know where we're headed, you don't have those things in space. So a spacecraft like Juno has to use the stars in order to navigate. Just like many of the early explorers, like Columbus or Magellan, used the stars to navigate at sea. That's how Juno navigates in space. Which is pretty cool. It's kind of like old meets new in our space age, right? Exactly. So that was attitude determination. What about attitude control? So attitude control is our ability to change or maintain the spacecraft's pointing, spin rate, or velocity. So for very small changes, like uh, turning the spacecraft or changing its spin rate, like we saw it just do, we turned to the, the burn attitude and we spun up to 5 RPM. For those types of changes, we use very small thrusters that are located around the vehicle. We have 12 of them, and uh, that's what we use to make small changes. For very large changes, uh, like the giant burn that we're about to do to get us captured into Jupiter orbit, we use a very large rocket engine that's uh, located on the aft end of the spacecraft, and that's what's going to give us the big change in velocity that we need to slow down. That's right. That's our business end of the spacecraft, which is going <laughs> to see a lot of work tonight. Yes. So we've also talked about the fact that the spacecraft is spin-stabilized. Do you want to describe a little bit what exactly that means? Sure. So just like you would apply a spiral to a football to make it fly in a straight path through space, uh, we apply a spin to the Juno spacecraft to make it maintain its uh, pointing so it can be very stable as it flies through space at great speeds and at very large velocities. Gotcha. Okay. And so there are obviously some advantages to being a spin-stabilized spacecraft. Do you want to describe some of those for the audience? Sure. There's several advantages to having a spinning spacecraft, the biggest of which is you're actually using physics to your advantage. Okay. So you're using the natural dynamics of the spacecraft to uh, ma maintain your stability so any uh, forces acting on the spacecraft can't disturb your pointing. Hmm. And so a lot of spacecraft are not spin stabilized. And the way they resist those outside forces is they use devices called reaction wheels. But the problem with reaction wheels is they consume power and they have mass. And so being uh, so power conscious, 
being a uh, solar-powered spacecraft way out at Jupiter, uh, we, we can't afford that kind of uh, power consumption. And also, by not having reaction wheels um, and ha saving that mass, we can put more science payload on the spacecraft. This is exactly why we're going to Jupiter in the first place. So exactly. it's great that we were able to make that kind of trade. Yes. So speaking of science instruments, right, do you know the spacecraft is spinning? And some people might be a little bit confused about what that means, uh, about how the instruments are able to see the planet. So can you describe how that works? So the instruments are mounted on the spacecraft body looking out into the spin plane. So as Juno rotates at two rotations per minute when we're in our science phase, uh, each of the instruments can scan their, their cameras and their sensors across Jupiter at two times every minute for the entire time we're closest to the planet. So it really helps maximize our science return. Great. All right. So this was Kristen telling you a lot about the guidance, navigation, and control aspects of our spacecraft. So we're going to let her get back to her console and continue monitoring the vehicle and hand it back to you, okay? All right. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Tracy. NASA's Juno is about to come face to face with the most massive and perhaps most treacherous planet in the solar system. Scientists have wanted to go there for decades, if not centuries. And here's why, out of all the planets in the solar system, this team picked Jupiter. Jupiter is by far the largest planet in the solar system. It has an influence on everything else. So if we want to understand how do planets form, how do solar systems form, we really have to start with Jupiter. By studying Jupiter, you're going to get one piece of the puzzle, um, not necessarily how life formed, but maybe how the ingredients that made up life eventually got spread around in the early solar system and got to us. And we care about the light elements because that's what we're made of. And we've got a puzzle about where these volatile elements, these lightweight elements like nitrogen, carbon, noble gases, uh, where they came from. To determine how much water is in Jupiter is essential to understand how this planet came to form and uh, then how it influenced the formation of all the, the other planets in the system. When the Earth formed, in the absence of Jupiter, it probably would have gathered very little water and organic molecules, which would have been concentrated in the colder outer part of the solar system. What Jupiter evidently did as it formed was to scatter cold material that contained water ice and organic materials to the inner solar system where it could be captured by the Earth and the other terrestrial planets. We learn about the origin of the solar system. We're learning about our own origins. We're learning about how life comes to be, about who we are and what our place is in the universe. It's about knowledge and about humanity's quest to understand. For me, that's why we need to study Jupiter and the solar system and almost everything. Juno's primary objective will be to study Jupiter's origin, its interior, atmosphere, and magnetosphere by studying these four things. Scientists hope to get a picture about the history of the solar system, how planets formed, and maybe even how life began. Steve Levin is the Juno project scientist. He is in the Juno science room where members of the science team and their families have gathered to watch. First thing, Steve, what is the single most important thing Juno is going to measure? So, in my opinion, the single most important thing Juno is going to measure is how much water is in Jupiter. Because the amount of water in Jupiter teaches us about a lot about how Jupiter formed. If Jupiter formed really far from the sun and drift, drifted inward, you'll get a different amount of water than if it formed where it is now. If it formed, as we think is likely, from icy planetesimals, large chunks of water, of ice, that collided together and made a giant planet, then you'll get a lot of water in it. You'll get a different amount of water than if it formed some other way, say, directly condensing from the same material that made the sun. So that single number, the global water abundance of Jupiter, will tell us a huge amount about how Jupiter formed and therefore about how solar systems form and about how all the planets in our solar system form and ultimately where do we come from. Well, obviously, this is all about the science. Are we collecting science now? Are we into our science orbits yet? So right now, because we're totally focused on firing that main engine and getting into orbit and turning the spacecraft back to the sun, we've turned off everything that's not essential to getting into orbit. That means all of the science instruments were turned off about four days ago. And right now, in our pass by Jupiter, 
for JOI, we're not going to get pretty much any science information at all. What I'm really looking forward to is 53 days from now, when Juno comes around again in its orbit and comes really close to Jupiter, that time, August 27th, we will have turned off the main engine, we won't be using the main engine at all, and we'll have all of our science instruments on, so that's when we'll get our first really good look at Jupiter from close up and learn how Jupiter is going to surprise us. We, we're running some of the animation right now, and the viewers can see there's this huge elliptical orbit. Why is that? Why are we not doing the usual circular orbit we always see with satellites? This is a long zip around orbit. Why is that? So remember, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get really close to the planet so that we can get our science. And at the same time, we don't want to spend a lot of time in the radiation belts and we want to have time to send all the data back to Earth. So our science orbits are 14-day orbits. We come around, we come really close to Jupiter for just a few hours, and then spend 14 days sending the data back, recovering, figuring out what we're doing next, and then doing it again every 14 days. To get into that orbit, we have to fire the main engine, of course, get into our big 53-day orbit, come around, do that science pass I mentioned, another 53-day 53 53-day 53 orbit, and then we'll fire the engine again to put us in that 14-day orbit where we can do all the science. And Steve, why not just go straight to the 14-day orbit? Why do these two preliminary orbits? Well, there's a couple of reasons why we want to do the preliminary orbits. Part of it is we don't want to fire the main engine that long. Instead of half an hour, two half an hour burns, an hour long burn of the main engine would actually take it beyond where we've tested it. It would probably work fine, but we don't like to operate where we haven't tried it before. But the other thing is we really want to get a look at Jupiter before we go into that 14 day pace where every 14 days we have a flyby and we're really trying to do everything and make it all work and there's not a lot of time. With 53-day orbits, we get this big, long 53-day orbit from when we first look at Jupiter, August 27th, to when we next come around and put ourselves in the 14-day orbit. That means we have time to look at how all the instruments operated, look at what Jupiter did to surprise us, and make sure that we're set up to get the science as we come around. So you've given the grace of having a little prep time. <laughs> Exactly. We've set up a little time for ourselves to prepare just in case something about Jupiter is different from what we expected. All right. We mentioned that the room there is full of scientists, and I'm told that some of the scientists in there are quite young. That's right. So we have with us some of the people who have obviously the science team, right, people who've worked on the science for Juno, and we have some members of the Goldstone Apple Valley Radio Telescope project. So we have students all over the United States and in fact all over the world who learn about science by doing real science. They operate a radio telescope that belongs to NASA. They operate it remotely and while they're learning science they're doing real science. Part of the science they've done is observe Jupiter and that contributes to the Juno mission so they're effectively members of our science team. I have one of them with me here today. Um, Renato, if you want to... Uh, talk a little bit and tell them about Juno, I think that would be a great thing. Uh, yeah, first of all, we are from Chile, so um, take uh, the control of the antenna from thousands of kilometers to the south is like um, a, a, a dream for, for any, any person who likes the science and the, and the universe. So uh, when you've observed Jupiter, of course, do you want to tell us just a little bit about how you do that and uh, what kind of observations you do with the telescope? Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, we connect to the um, Lewis Center, and then uh, they, like, thanks to the, some software, we take the control of the antenna, and thanks of that, uh, we collect the the. Um, I don't know how to say in English, but the, like the the information Data. of the of the antenna and Jupiter. Thank you very much. So I guess it's back to you, Gay, from the science team room. I think we're all really excited and looking forward to JLI. Thank you, Steve. All right, we are just a few minutes away, about oh, four, four minutes or so minutes away from the start of the main engine burn. Let's listen in on the team.
All right, Stuart, we are just about a minute away from the main engine burn. Can you explain what this is and how critical it is to the team? Sure, we're waiting for the start of the burn. Uh, there's going to be a tone or two that we'll hear just in advance by a minute or two. We'll get a tone or two right at the start of the burn. And this will indicate that the burn is starting, a 35-minute burn that will put us into orbit in this kind of an attitude, burning in such a way that it slows our velocity. We're moving in the down direction, and so we're going to slow ourselves so that we're not moving as fast, and that will put us into orbit. Um, we're also noticing from our Doppler signal, which you might have seen, that we're doing exactly the things that we expected that we would do. We performed the turn, we performed the spin-up, and we're seeing those signals in the Doppler. We'll also see that signal very clearly in the Doppler once the burn starts, so we're waiting for that as well. Right. Everything's looking good. Standing by. Systems, this is Nav. Go ahead, Nav. Yeah, we see the expected uh, sharp shift upward and the Doppler residuals indicating the main engine has started. Yeah. Copy that. That's good news. We are uh, still awaiting confirmation of that in the phone. All right, the main engine burn has started and that will continue for another 35 minutes and that's the time they need to put this spacecraft into a 53 day orbit that is the orbit that they are looking for and while we wait let's check in again with Tracy Drain over at Lockheed Martin Hello, Gay. Yes, we're all very excited to hear that the burn started on time. That's the whole reason why we're here tonight. So the team is really, really happy about that. But for, for now, we're going to take a minute, have a little bit of a breather, and have a conversation with Will Santiago, who is our thermal lead on the project. So, Will, why don't you explain to our audience what it is that a thermal engineer does on a mission like Juno? As the Juno thermal engineer, we're primarily responsible for making sure all the temperatures are within the limits. So we have the electronics in the vault, for example, that want to be out operating at room temperature to optimize the performance. At the same time, we have these uh, instruments like GIRM that detects heat. It is looking at the auroras in the infrared spectrum. So it needs to be really cold to make the instrument the most sensitive possible. So we have all these computer models that allow us to predict the temperatures and also the power, the heated power that we use in the spacecraft. Okay, and so when we talk about JOI, right? There's a lot of challenges associated with JOI. There are also thermal challenges associated with getting into orbit. Can you describe some of those for us? So during JOI, which is happening right now, of mm -hmm. course, um, <laughs> we are at the JOI attitude. That means that the solar panels are pointed away from the sun. Right. And that means that the temperatures of the solar panels drop very quickly, and we're seeing temperatures on the order of minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, colder than anything else here Absolutely. on Earth. Absolutely. <laughs> um, they were designed for that, so the engineers early on in development took that into account into the design. At the same time, JOI itself, we had the main engine burning right now, yeah. and that means we're seeing temperatures on the order of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, if not more. Yeah. So JOI itself has all these extreme temperatures environment. It's one of the most unique phases of the mission for us with respect to all the thermal gradients that we see on the spacecraft. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. And speaking of unique and environments, with our spacecraft going into orbit at Jupiter, um, we have a unique electronics vaults where we put the electronics to protect them from the environment. There are some thermal challenges associated with that too, right? Absolutely. The vault itself is relatively small mm -hmm. um, and we have all these instruments packaged in this really, really tiny space. So we have all these electronics that are generating heat just like your computer would at home. Yeah. But there's no fence, there's no air in space, so we had to figure out a way how do we get rid of the energy. Um, so the vault along the walls have these louvers that are just like window blinds. Mm -hmm. They open and close based on the temperature. So when the temperature of the vault gets a little bit too warm, 
the louvers open and expose this radiator panel. It's not a hole, yeah. it's just a coating on the vault that allows us to reject the heat out to space. And once the temperature drops back down, there is um, the louvers kind of close automatically, and that's how we save heater power because we use quite a bit of heater power on oh, thermal. Oh, that's right, yeah. So one of the things that Kristen mentioned earlier is that we don't have reaction wheels, that saves us on power. Thermal is one of the most power hungry subsystems on board the spacecraft. You guys use what, like half? We use over <laughs> half of the power. So it is. it was very important for the design early on to take into account all these considerations to make sure like we were tightly um, insulated. Right. Um, so you see a lot of thermal blankets around it and we had to apply optical coatings to make sure that we don't reject too much heat into space. That's right. Now, speaking of all the things we're doing in order to make sure things don't get too hot or don't get too cold on the spacecraft, we have to know for sure all that stuff's going to work before we launch the vehicle and it's on its way through cruise into JOI. So can you talk a little bit about what we did pre-launch in order to ensure the thermal subsystem was going to work? All right, so the spacecraft was built here at our Lockheed Martin facilities in Denver, Colorado. Once it's all insulated and buttoned up, we actually transport it over to a building next door that has this large thermal chamber. It's called the Space Simulator Lab. Yeah. And we take the spacecraft and we raise it up and we drop it into the chamber. And then we close the chamber and pour, pull all the air out of the chamber, just like the vacuum of space. Yeah. And we start flowing liquid nitrogen along the walls. Temperature is on the order of minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. So it's really cold. Uh -huh. um, the chamber also, on the other hand, has lamps to simulate a solar load. And during a three-week period, we go through hot and cold cycles on the spacecraft. Uh -huh. We power all the instruments. We power the spacecraft components to make sure they're operating just like they would in space. Okay. Now, I know we only have a little bit of time left. So the one thing I thought was cool you mentioned to me is that as our spacecraft is passing by the planet, we can actually sense the heat from the planet. Can you say just a few words about that? So the Jupiter formation days, it's still hot. Mm -hmm. It's still cooling off from the days of solar system formation. So as we pass by the planet, we actually can detect temperature increases just because of the heat of Jupiter blasting the spacecraft for a short duration of time, but we see a little bit of heat pulse in the telemetry, and we expect to see that during JOI. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so. We're going to let Will head back to his console and continue keeping an eye on the tones as they come in and pass it back to you, Gay. Okay? All right, thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Will. And it's about 24 minutes past the hour. We're less than a half hour away from the end of the main engine burn. Mission Juno is a partnership. JPL manages the mission for Principal Investigator Scott Bolton of the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. The mission is part of the New Frontiers program, which is managed by NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And the spacecraft was built by Lockheed Martin Space Systems in Denver, Colorado. There have been other missions to Jupiter before. There was Pioneer, Galileo, but unlike the others, Juno is solar powered. And as Bill Nye will tell you, as only Bill Nye can, Powering a spaceship a half billion miles away from the sun is not easy. In Roman mythology, which of course is rooted from Greek mythology, Juno was the uh, wife and sister uh, goddess. All right. Juno project manager Rick Nybakken is with us, and this is a huge day for the team. I have to say my heart stopped at 818 right then. Did it? Was it the same for you? Well, it stopped <laughs> and then restarted. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Just well, like our main engine. And I'm sure it was for the entire team. And this is a pretty big team. Just yesterday, the group went to the Rose Bowl. We have some footage to show everyone. You guys took a group photo. Is we that did. right? Oh, and look at that. It was quite a day for us because, in a way, this was a, a pre-milestone to today. The team got to celebrate the achievement. It's taken 10 years to get to this point, five years to get to launch, and another five years to get to Jupiter. So we're really excited to be here. And that stencil is actual size? Yes. In fact, that's the first time that we've ever seen the spacecraft full size. Oh, really? It's so large that we could never open all the arrays in any of the facilities. That's we right. Were in. So when you built the solar arrays, you were never able to test them at the same time. You couldn't open them all up because the spacecraft was so big. That's right. So one by one. So in a way, this is the first time we've ever seen the full size spacecraft. It must have been a real kick for the team. It was. Oh, and we also have a video that shows a comparison of this spacecraft to other spacecraft. Can we roll that? Let's take a look. Yeah, so you can see 
different nuclear-powered spacecraft. There's the Mars Science Lab, and there, of course, is Pluto New Horizons, and then Cassini. These are all nuclear-powered, and we're the first mission to go out to an outer planet that's solar-powered, and you can see the massive size of our arrays, 60 square meters, almost 19,000 solar cells on those arrays. And the reason being is because of the solar arrays, you need that much space to get the energy that you need? Yes, we have a very power-efficient spacecraft, but the sunlight's only 1 25th at Jupiter of what we get at Earth. And so we had to take these solar cells and determine how well they perform under low light, low temperature, and radiation conditions, and then we size the arrays appropriately. Those arrays give us over 500 watts of power. 500 watts, uh, five light bulbs, five 100 watt light bulbs. Just like four, five floor lamps in your home. Wow. It's very power efficient. And, and let's give people an idea of how big it is. I'm, I've been told that it would fit into an NBA basketball court. <laughs> well, yes. In one dimension, it's much bigger. But it's not quite rim to rim, but it is massive. You can get a sense of the scale right there. Um, it it's a beautiful is, vehicle, isn't it? It is. And we talked a little bit about that, the design of a spinning spacecraft. It spins because it reduces the need for energy, um, and it's an old design, a relatively old design, that a mature design. Yeah, there's not that many spinning spacecraft out there, but it gives us a lot of stability. It simplifies our operations, and we have a plethora, eight science instruments on board. And just on the body of the spacecraft alone, we have 18 different sensors looking out to the side. And so the spinning spacecraft helps share all the viewing time. So all the instruments get equal observation time with Jupiter and space. And that's another thing, the fact that this spacecraft always faces the sun. So it's a polar orbit, but it never stops looking at the sun, except in a case like this when we have to turn away to burn our engines. That's right. If you're the sun, and this is Jupiter, the spacecraft mm -hmm. comes in over the top, and all of its orbits are in this plane, so we never go into Jupiter's shadow. A pretty important requirement for a solar-powered spacecraft. Right. Um, so we are getting close to the burn. We're part way through. Bring us up to speed. What's happening with the spacecraft right now? We've got some imagery of the burn. Um, what's taking place? Bring us up to speed. Well, the main engine burn is 35 minutes, and it'll slow us down just enough to go from a super long orbit. We would just fly by Jupiter without this burn, which of course we don't want. After 35 minutes, we'll be in a 53-day orbit, and when the burn completes at 8.53 p.m., we'll immediately start to spin down to 2 RPM and turn back to sun. That's, that'll happen by about 9.30 p.m., and that's obviously really critical for right. a solar-powered mission. So right now it's on battery power because it has to turn away from the sun. That's so right. you want to get back to the sun as soon as you can. Yeah, this is the only time in the mission where getting to the sun is second priority. The first priority right now is getting into orbit. And it'll keep firing the main engine until we're successful. And right now it looks like the main engine is just doing great. You mentioned something at the news conference earlier today. You said this is not the first time you fired that engine. This is the third time. Yeah, it's a very well-designed mission. We fired the main engine twice, very successfully, back in 2012. And we know how to fire the main engine. It worked perfectly twice. But what's new here is we've never done it in Jupiter's environment. And the first peak of radiation that we expected to see is already past us. What's the And the, the next second? one, it's after the main engine. Burn. Okay. So uh, it's looking really good. But this is exactly how we designed the spacecraft and the sequence to operate. And that's how it always is with missions. You prepare as much as you possibly can, but there's always that uncertainty when you get there. That's right. We worry and we fret and we test and right. we go over it again and again and again. And this is probably one of the most thoroughly tested sequences. We started way back in 2011 before we launched. We've thought about every conceivable scenario. So we're, but nevertheless, we're really glad to see the main engine burn going so well. But you just don't know what Jupiter is going to throw you. It's a really crazy place to go. Yeah. I mean, some, someone who's outside the business would say, are you nuts? Why are you going into the most hazardous places, especially this deep into the radiation belts? But, oh. you know, we spent five years before launch thinking about exactly how 
to make the spacecraft ready to handle that intense environment. All right, so you'll be holding your breath one more time at the end of the run? Yes. <laughs> right. We'll certainly be paying attention. <laughs> you it's going you well and so me far. both. All right. Thank you so much. Rick Nybakken, he you. is the project manager for the Juno project. And you're watching live coverage of Juno's arrival at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And like, right now, we are going back to the MSA and rejoining Stuart for an update. Hi, Gay. Hi, Stuart. Hey, Gay. Everything's going really well so far, as far as we can tell. The tones that signal the start of the burn uh, weren't seen right away, but we did, in That's fact, stretching. record them, and we verified that we received them at our other DSN complex. So we verified with the tones that we started the burn. More than that, though, we also verified with something called Doppler, the change in the frequency of the radio signal that we're still getting. It's just the regular carrier signal that doesn't have information encoded on it, and we can tell that that signal changed at the moment of the start of the burn. Uh, and change in its slope in such a way that the change in velocity was recorded and we could tell that we're starting to record that change in velocity as we're now slowing ourselves down as we go into Jupiter's orbit in that 35 minute burn. So we're monitoring the Doppler. We also saw the Doppler changes for the turn and for the spin up and we'll see more Doppler changes a little later that accompany the tones and telling us something about what's going on on the spacecraft. Everything looks great so far. We're a little less than halfway through the entire 35 minute burn. All right, well, the primary goal of this mission is to improve our understanding of Jupiter's formation and evolution. The spacecraft will investigate the planet's origins, interior structure, deep atmosphere, and a magnetosphere. Juno's study of Jupiter will help us understand the history of our solar system and provide new insights into how planetary systems form and develop in our galaxy and beyond. Uh, Gay and others, I, I think we're about one halfway through the 35 minute burn. We're, we've got another halfway to go, but what that means is that we started the burn on one side of Jupiter's equator, and we're going to end it on the other side of Jupiter's equator, and we're right now roughly crossing the equator of Jupiter at the closest approach point to Jupiter. It's actually three degrees north of the equator. And that closest approach point, closer than no other spacecraft has, has ever been before, is about 2,800 miles above the cloud tops, or 4,500 kilometers. And our velocity, our speed, is 58 kilometers a second. I'll translate that for you. That's 36 miles per second, or about 130,000 miles per hour. That's the fastest we'll be going relative to Jupiter as we go right past at its closest approach point. We'll slow down a little bit as we go past that. We're continuing to slow down in general with our burn just enough at the end of that 35 minute burn to put us into orbit about Jupiter in the right 53 and a half day orbit that Gay was referring to earlier. Mission names are often acronyms. For instance, MSL means Mars Science Laboratory, or OMG stands for Oceans Melting Greenland. But as Principal Investigator Scott Bolton explains, Juno is named after a goddess who could see through clouds. 
In Roman mythology, which of course is rooted from Greek mythology, Juno was the uh, wife and sister uh, goddess of Jupiter, or in Greek it was Zeus, and the uh, Greek name for Juno was Hera. So they were companions, and Zeus, of course, was the king of the gods, and she was the queen of the gods, Juno. She was married and uh, cared a lot about children in marriage and keeping everybody uh, well-behaved and sort of like a good mother would. And Zeus was uh, sort of being naughty with some friends and doing things, and he saw Juno looking down at him or starting to come close to him. So he cast a veil of clouds around himself and his friends and tried to hide his uh, naughtiness. But of course, Juno was a, was a fairly powerful god herself, and she saw enough that she said, okay, I'm suspicious, and kind of traveled down and used her powers to look right through the clouds and see the true nature of Jupiter and understand what he was really up to. And that's exactly what the Juno spacecraft does for us, is that it goes there with special instruments in a special orbit and uses its magical powers to see right through Jupiter's clouds and understand its true nature, which is, holding these secrets for us about how uh, the solar system formed and where we all came from. Scott Bolton, the PI from the Southwest Research Institute, joins us now. This has been your baby. How does it feel to be seeing us go through the burn like this? It is incredibly exciting. I mean, it's going well. The rocket's burning. We're slowing down and getting into orbit around Jupiter. It's, it's so great of a feeling. Now, what are you watching out for uh, as we go through this burn? Are there key moments that you're watching? So there's a couple of milestones that okay. I think are really critical. One of them is the burn, the 20 minute mark on the burn, which we're coming up to really quick. We're at, oh, 39 so, minutes oh, past the hour. We're, so we're at it, basically. We're at it. And so that's a critical point because although we're not in the orbit that we really desire, we're pro we probably burned enough that we're captured by Jupiter. It's interesting. We heard the team clapping just a little while ago. So they were clapping at the fact that we are technically, it may not be the orbit that you are hoping for just yet, but we are already in orbit around Jupiter. Right. Even if the engine stopped right now, I think we would just be in a very large orbit. Okay. So we've made the transition from being in orbit around the sun being in orbit around Jupiter. At least that's the theoretical predictions, if, but it's right around that 20 minute mark, so we should have just crossed that. Every minute now is icing on the cake. We're getting it better and better into the closer orbit that we want, which improves the science, gets everything that we want. And then there's another critical time, about a half hour after the burn stops, where we actually have to turn the spacecraft back to the sun. That gets us power positive again. Right now we're running batteries. Right? We can't get any power because the solar rays are not pointing at the sun. We've got to point that back to the sun so that the juices start flowing through Juno's veins again. That's what gives you the electricity for the rest of the mission. So for a solar-powered spacecraft, that's your lifeline? That's it. That's the critical time. You've got to get back on the sun. So we're not out of everything, all the, all the risks, but we're, we, the majority of the risk we've already accomplished. Earlier today, the team released a movie, The Approach vi Video, and we can run it um, and show people what you see as Juno comes in. It's, it was taken five, up to five days ago, correct? Because you had to turn off your instruments. But here it is. What do you see when you see that? So what you're seeing actually is the first time that humans and any time in history have actually been able to see the motion of the heavenly bodies. I mean, this is how nature works. We've never actually been able to see it. This is what Galileo exactly. realized. That was what Galileo saw in the 1600s. Absolutely. He pointed the first telescope up at the planet. He was clever enough to realize that over a few nights, those stars near Jupiter seemed to change position. And he realized, oh my gosh, that means they're going around Jupiter. And of course that changed our culture forever because all of a sudden you had, Earth wasn't the center. Here's something else that's got things going around it. That was a very profound moment for our culture. It changed us, our perspective on even ourselves and how we fit into nature. And now, 400, 500 years right. later almost, we're able to actually see the motion ourselves. This is the first time. We haven't even got a movie of any planet 
and Moon together. And so it's very, it's great that Juno was coming in at this angle and had the right kind of camera to capture this motion. You've described that picture like it was a mini solar system. Is Jupiter kind of like that? Absolutely. That that shows you. Jupiter is really a mini solar system. It has a few moons. Those are the Galilean moons. Mm -hmm. Those are the brightest. You're seeing them go around at different periods. That's natural harmony. And if we back off of our whole solar system, that must be what we would look like. Now, of course, if you did back off and you saw the sun, the easiest planets would be Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Earth and its neighbors would be really tiny dots, but that's the way we must look. And if you back off of that, our sun is going around the galaxy. I mean, it's so best. the harmony is there in nature at every scale. Even if I go down to the atom and the electron going around the nucleus. Well, let's talk about the camera that took that image, JunoCam. Uh, it has a spe special significance to you and also the team. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. We, we, that camera is truly an outreach camera. It was designed to be able to get the first picture of Jupiter's poles. And as we fly over, we'll capture there that. There it is. You can see that in this video right here. That is JunoCam right there. And JunoCam is an outreach camera in the sense that you can go onto our websites and you can the, the raw data will be loaded up there for the public and schools to actually process themselves and create these images. And they can do more than that. They can actually go on the websites and help vote where we point the camera. So if they've got a special or favorite feature on Jupiter, like the Great Red Spot or some other little storm, mm -hmm. they can vote, demonstrate why they think it's important, the public gets a chance to share in that vote, and whoever gets the most votes, that's where we're going to point the camera. And we'll have that up and running uh, a little bit later in the mission. As we go into our prime mission, the public's going to get a chance to join our team and actually get the images and help decide how they, where the camera points. And what sort of response have you received from schools, from teachers, from students? Oh, an incredible response. And we were just getting started, and, and a lot of the amateur astronomy community have jumped on board. Whole schools have jumped on board. We threw out a little experiment as we flew by the Earth a few years ago, and we didn't even have the website up yet. But we put the data out on the web, and while we were sleeping, in the middle of the night, we woke up and all these images of the Earth were already made for us. So it's great to see, you know, citizen science. The public exactly. is joining our team, and we need them. And so they will have access to the actual raw data and be able to do what they will? Will they be able to work with the imagery themselves? They will. I mean, what we will load on is a little bit less than just raw because that's a little difficult to deal with. Okay. But they will be basically each filter somewhat raw arranged and they can mix the colors the way they wish. They can bring out different features by dialing these things up. And they doing what also, scientists do right, themselves. They, they can process them. Okay. They could make a little movie, you know, with taking that sequence. Just like we just, just like saw. Just like we just saw. All right. And not only that, we have JunoCam, but I'm told that you also have some hitchhikers on board this spacecraft. Can you talk we about do. that? I often get asked, do you have any passengers on board? And, and we do, but they're Lego minifigures. And we have um, Galileo uh, on the left side. In the middle is Juno, the goddess. And on the right side is Jupiter with his lightning bolt. And what are they made of? They're actually made out of spacecraft-grade aluminum. Mm -hmm. And they're inside of our spacecraft. They're getting the ride of their life right now. <laughs> and I they've bet. got the best view of any of us. <laughs> And why did they decide to have these extra passengers, so to speak? So it was part of, a, of an outreach education program. Lego's a very educationally minded company. And I wanted to reach out and, uh, and help children work both creatively and analytically. And of course, when you're building Legos, you're, you're doing both the mathematics and you're creating something new. And so we reached out to the company and NASA embraced that and, uh, and created a little bit of a collaboration. And we ended up suggesting if they wanted to fly some figures, they could do that. We helped, you know, kind of jointly designed them. They made them themselves. Of course, I gave them the specs and what kind of metals to use and mm -hmm. what to do. And then NASA tested them just to make sure everything was okay. And then we mounted them on the spacecraft and off they went into space. All right. 
Well, we are just a few minutes away from the end of the burn, but what's going through your head? What are you most anxious about, and what are you looking most forward to as part of the science team? Well, now I'm, I'm a little more relaxed than I was uh, before the burn started, but I'm re and so I'm really looking forward to the science at this point. I'm starting to realize, okay, we're going into orbit. This is going to get started. It's fantastic. And... Um, I'm just so curious about the discoveries that we can make and learning about our beginnings and what can Jupiter tell us about how the solar system was made. And managing expectations, because this was such a critical moment, we turned off all the science instruments right now. When can we expect some science coming back? Uh, a couple of days from now, we'll turn the instruments back on, but our first orbit is 53 days long. And so we come back to Jupiter with all our eyes and ears open the next time. Uh, but that's not till the end of August. But we will have spectacular discoveries on that at that time. All right. Well, I know you want to get back in there. So thanks for Thank joining you. us. Thanks for Good having luck me. to you, and we'll be all holding our breath. All right. Take thanks. care, Scott. So it's about 48 minutes past the hour here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We are getting very close to the end of the 35-minute burn. Let's hand it over now to our mission commentator, Stuart Stevens, and Tracy Drain in the control rooms at JPL and Lockheed Martin. Hi, Gay. Um, we're happy to be almost through our burn. You can tell from the Doppler that we're looking at that everything is going smoothly. We're continuing to burn and change our velocity. We've got about five minutes or less now at this point before we complete the burn. You heard some minor celebration earlier. You'll hear more when we complete the burn um, because we burned long enough, roughly 20 minutes or so, so that we are now in an orbit around Jupiter. It's just not quite the right one we want to be in. As we burn more and more, we'll get closer to the right orbit period of 53 and a half days that we want to be in. Right now it's a much larger period if we were to stop the burn at this moment. So both the tones, we aren't getting any tones right now, but we will get one at the end. And the Doppler are telling us that everything's working on schedule and we're just holding our breaths for another four minutes or so, both here and at Lockheed Martin with Tracy. Yep, and you can kind of see if you look behind us at the MSA, the team here at Lockheed Martin, people are standing on their feet, you can feel the anticipation building. It's pretty great that we've been able to see, as Stuart mentioned, that the Doppler is going pretty smoothly, and so the tension level isn't exactly higher because we feel from as much information as we have in hand, that things should be going well, we should be captured, but we're all eagerly awaiting the tone that'll tell us that the burn has indeed cut off on Delta V and we're in the exact orbit that we want to be in, so we're all waiting for that to happen. All right, we are about 30 seconds away from the minimum burn, which was 52 minutes after the hour. And I see a display here, and the estimated orbit at this point is about 62 days, and it keeps counting down the longer we burn the shorter the orbital period at this point, at this 
stage of the burn. It's about 61 days. So we're just counting down. All stations on June Accord, it's time we see the tone for minimum burn timer. Almost there. <laughs> yes. June Accord, we have the tone for burn cutoff on Delta B. Roger, don't move, Juno. Juno, welcome to Jupiter. This is prop. Uh, <laughs> Based on the <laughs> from the phone, burn time was 2102 seconds, only differing one second off of the pre burn predictions. See that? Welcome okay. to Jupiter. At this time, we also see the tone for the come down to 2 RPM start.
And a big sigh of relief for the team here at JPL and at Lockheed Martin. And right now, NASA Acting Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, Jeff Yoder, is here. We are officially in orbit around Jupiter. How's it feel? It feels great. I this mean, is phenomenal. The fact that it's happening on your watch, how does that feel? You know, with over 100 missions in the Science Mission Directorate, seeing that an event like this just highlights the talent of the NASA, the contractor, and our partnership team to be able to just accomplish an, an incredible, difficult mission like this. It's just phenomenal. And the fact that we have accomplished, I mean, we are now in orbit at Jupiter. What does this mean? What sort of pathway does this forge for future missions? For future missions, this is just one step in a, uh, a lot of firsts, really, for the Jupiter mission that, that uh, uh, provides technologies and, and advances for uh, up, upcoming other missions. It also answers, uh, will help answer some of the key puzzles and key questions for how our planets are formed. And what's ahead for the, the Science Mission Directorate? What's coming up? So we have a lot, again, with 100 missions, we have a tremendous amount of opportunities. Coming up this fall, we have another mission called OSIRIS-REx, launches in, in the uh, September time frame, that will go to a, uh, an asteroid called Bennu, that will uh, mm -hmm. retrieve uh, a sample and return. We also have a, uh, a mission, a partnership with, uh, with NOAA, our other partners, that will take a, a, a mission called GOES-R that will launch later this fall, and another Earth science mission called Cygnus that will launch in the November time frame. It's a constellation of eight microsats. And then also some instruments that we will launch to the International Space Station, supporting both our Earth science and astrophysics missions. So there's a lot ahead for us. So you have a full plate. A very full plate. All very right. Plate. Well, congratulations. Thank and you. And many more successes ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Well, let's go back to Stuart in Mission Control. You know, yes, we have the burn complete, but this is not the end of the workday for Juno. Can you explain? Sure, we're really excited to be in orbit now, but um, now that we've completed the burn, we've started our spin down to 2 RPM. We'll hear a tone shortly for spin down complete, and then we'll start some mutation damping, and eventually do a turn after the end of your broadcast back to sun point. We have to get sun on the arrays, and tomorrow we'll turn back to the Earth and do other activities. But right now we're just glad to be in orbit. are officially in orbit at Jupiter. Right now, we are going to introduce you to our new director here at JPL. His name is Dr. Michael Watkins. And uh, Mike has been on the job for a big whopping four days now. Since Friday. And look, you have a successful mission, not bad. Yeah, right. it's, a good, it's a good start, but you know, <laughs> you and I have sat at this table many times, so you know, I worked here for 20 years before last Friday, but the first time as a director, it's a good way to get off to a good start. And this let's is just talk a regular Fourth of July. <laughs> yeah, here a in regular. Oh, we do this all the time. Absolutely. But let's talk about that. You have been on missions before. You know what it's like for the team. What is it like to have a success like that after you've worked so hard years on something? Well, you know, it's, a, it's a combination of excitement and relief because you know, you, you want to, you're overjoyed that it's there and that the reason you did the mission is now come to fruition. At the same time, you can't help but worry that something can go wrong. So there's a great feeling of relief in addition to that joy that, that, you know, that you're there at Jupiter or you're there on Mars. Uh, but don't forget that this is the beginning of the science mission, right? So right. It's, in some sense, it's the end of the voyage, but it's really the beginning of the science. So the reason we do these missions is to learn about Jupiter and to get all the great science out of the mission. And that's really what's just now starting for the Juno team. All right, and they're still much more to do, and we've just heard over the VOCA that the spin-down is completed. There's still a little bit more work to be done with this spacecraft. It still has That's to right. do a few more things, right? It has to get some oriented back, you know, point at the Earth, uh, get the solar rays pointed at the sun, um, and you know, get back in communication with us, get itself back in, in kind of a nominal mode. Um, and, and when it does that, then we'll know that we're, we're in perfect shape to initiate the science mission. So when will you be a little bit more comfortable, when it's back on Earth point or when it's back on Sun point? Um, well, yeah, in, in just shortly, like another, another hour or so later, later tonight, we'll, we'll know that everything's back in, in good shape. But it's looking good so far. Oh, it looks perfect. It looks great. All Absolutely right. great. All right. Well, thank you and welcome. Sure. Nice, nice start, Director. Thanks very much. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to Jupiter. Welcome to Jupiter. <laughs> the spacecraft is turning to the sun and we'll swap back to the medium gain antenna. 
oh, at about 9.07, 9.11 p.m. our time. It should be back on sun and off battery power by about 9.30 p.m. Pacific time. Our thanks to Stuart Stevens and Aunt Tracy Drain for explaining this very complicated engineering and teamwork that has to take place in an event like this. We're going to wrap things up here in Mission Control. Coming up next, the post-JOI news briefing is at 10 p.m. Pacific Time, 1 a.m. Eastern Time. And for more information on the Juno mission, go to www.nasa.gov slash Juno. So there you have it. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. Okay, you've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes on the limit. Flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes. Are you getting a TV picture now, Houston? Neil, yes, we are getting a TV picture. You're in our field with you now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap. Good morning, my name is DC Eagle from NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. We're here today to talk about the Juno mission to Jupiter. And currently, Juno is 7,071,000 miles from the gas giant, and on July 4th, it's going to light up its main engine and head into orbit. So to talk about Juno today and its science and Jupiter orbit insertion, we have with us Ed Hurst, Juno mission manager from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Scott Bolton, Juno Principal Investigator from the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio. Steve Levin, Juno Project Scientist from JPL. Jack Connerney, he's the Juno Deputy Principal Investigator and Magnetometer Investigation Lead from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Fran Baganall, Juno Magnetosphere's co-investigator from the University of Colorado at Boulder. So before we start things off with our panel today, I'd like to introduce Diane Brown. She's the Juno Program Executive from NASA Washington. Thank you. Good morning. We could not be more excited about being back on Jupiter's doorstep and being so close to our arrival on Monday. NASA has been to Jupiter before, but never this close. And we know a lot about Jupiter from previous missions, but Juno was poised to answer the questions that we still have. Juno is the second of three missions within NASA's New Frontiers program, which is in the Science Mission Directorate in the, um, in the Planetary Science Division. And the New Horizons mission, uh, which some of you will probably remember last July, gave us those amazing, amazing photos as it flew past, past Pluto. And the OSIRIS-REx mission is scheduled to launch this September, and it will fly out to the near-Earth asteroid Bennu and do a sample return, and we expect to see those samples as early as 2023. Juno was selected in the second announcement of opportunities for the New Frontiers program. It was selected in 2005, and it launched in 2011. The Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama manages the New, or the, um, New Frontiers program for the Planetary Science Division. NASA has a long history of milestones on the 4th of July, and we look forward to making our own fireworks this year. We could not have reached this milestone without the years of dedicated work and, and planning by the entire Juno Science team and the um, admission team, and we thank them all for their dedication. NASA's vision is to reach for new heights and reveal the unknown for the benefit of humankind, and Juno is a perfect example of how NASA reaches for that vision. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Diane. And to start things off with our panel, we'll go back to Ed Hurst, the mission manager for Juno. Thank you, DC. Um, I wanted to start out reminding people of some salient features on our spacecraft. Um, the most prominent thing that you see are our large solar panels. Each of them are 10 meters wide, uh, 10 meters long, and tip to tip, they span um, rim to rim on a basketball court. Uh, they produce 500 watts at Jupiter range, and that's um, enough power to produce, uh, to, to power our instruments 
and all the electronics inside. The other salient feature is right under the, um, the high gain antenna, it's this box that's under here. Um, that's what we call our electronics vault. Inside of that box, we have all of our sensitive electronics and that's what that, that, um, that vault is made out of titanium and it's gonna protect the electronics from the intense radiation belts while we're at Jupiter. Um, the star of the show on July 4th is on the back side. Um, and you see here we have a main engine cover and right where the stand comes into the back is our main engine nozzle. And that is um, the engine that's gonna produce about 645 newtons of force and over 35 minutes slow the spacecraft down so that we get into orbit. Um, so what have we been doing for the last few days to get ready for July 4th? Uh, 10 days ago, we opened that main engine cover so that the engine would be ready uh, to fire when we get to July 4th. And a couple of days ago, we pressurized the whole system so that the engine is ready to go, all the propulsion and all the, the pipes and valves are all ready to fire. Um, today, we're sending the last commands up to the spacecraft, and once those commands are sent, it'll be hands-off from the team here on the ground. We'll continue to monitor the spacecraft and make sure that everything is executing as we expect it to execute, um, but the spacecraft is on its own, and it's designed to take care of itself along with all of the command sequences that we've sent it. Um, so to show you a little bit more about what's gonna happen on July 4th, can I have the first animation? Or my only animation, um, what, you see, <laughs> what you see on the screen, um, the little puffs that you see right now are our smaller thrusters. Um, they're 4.5 Newtons in size, and they're reorienting the spacecraft so that we get the engine in the proper direction so that when it fires, uh, we're slowing the spacecraft down. You now see the thrusters, they're spinning the spacecraft up from two revolutions per minute to five revolutions per minute, so that when we do the burn that you're seeing on the screen now, the spacecraft is in a stable configuration, and over that 35 minutes, we get the thrust in the direction that we need to get it. Um, we then slow the spacecraft back down in revolutions to two RPM, um, and we turn the vehicle back to the sun to start recharging the batteries, and start communicating back with Earth. Um, while we're doing the burn, we are in communication with the spacecraft via tones. It's a, a modulation that we get on the radio signal that tells us that all the events are happening as designed. Um, so that's what we're looking forward to on July 4th. And I'll hand it over to Scott to start talking about some of the science. Thanks, Ed. So, um, I'm just so excited to be here. I can't uh, express that enough. I mean, in just a few days, we're about to arrive at Jupiter. Um, and it's hard to believe. Uh, it's been a, I'm so proud to be part of this team that has accomplished all of this. Um, you know, what Juno is really about is learning about the recipe for how solar systems are made. We really, scientists don't really understand how the planets are made. We know after the sun formed, something happened and we were able to form Jupiter. It took up more than half of the material that was left over. And it's a little bit different than the sun and we don't completely understand that and that's really the first step in that recipe is how do you make solar systems? Something happens that allows a star to be born and then afterwards the planets. And that first step eventually leads to us and uh, Juno's poised to be able to make some great progress on learning about that step, not only to explain how our solar system formed and maybe how we got here, but how other solar systems that NASA's discovering and other uh, star systems, uh, how they get created. Jupiter's our example. And in order to, to accomplish uh, the science objectives of, that we're set out to do and the measurements that we want, we have a set of tools on board uh, Juno. Uh, we call them science instruments but they're just different uh, tools that we use, uh, tricks of the trade, so to speak, and I wanna give you a little idea of how those work. They're situated around the spacecraft uh, that you're a little bit familiar with from these images and, and what uh, Ed just explained, 
And uh, I'll show you that on this uh, first animation. Um, you'll see sort of an x-ray view. The things that are in color are the science instruments. They're all looking out between the solar arrays. The solar arrays are, uh, of course, the spacecraft spinning, so everybody gets their turn to look at Jupiter. This was a very efficient design. In the middle, you see all those boxes cluttered together. That's inside of our radiation vault. So that's a giant box that is about 400 pounds of titanium to shield sort of the vital organs of Juno. I mean, this is where the computer and the brains lie, all the sensitive electronics. We have to shield it because Jupiter is basically uh, the harshest region in the entire solar system. It is a planet on steroids. Everything about it is extreme. Uh, the radiation would just uh, not only kill people, but it would knock out our electronics, and so everything's protected uh, inside. That was one of the aspects of our design that was very efficient. We decided uh, this is the first time uh, NASA's tried that. We put all the uh, electronics in this vault. Another aspect was having this spin where the, so, uh, where the instruments are able to look out between the solar arrays. So we don't have to spend a, a lot of uh, effort uh, turning the spacecraft. Everybody uh, kind of gets their turn as we spin through. So it was a very simple, efficient design. And that's sort of a theme throughout Juno. Um, what I'm going to show you now is some exciting new data that we just got last week. But uh, before I show that to you, let me give you a little bit of a background of what you're going to see. So as you travel from the Earth to Jupiter, you're traveling through interplanetary space. You're basically in the sun's domain. The sun fills interplanetary space with charged particles. We call them the solar wind. It's blowing through space. Um, that solar wind, these charged particles, ions and electrons and protons, um, they basically would bang into Earth, but the Earth has a protective shield called a magnetosphere, a magnetic field around it. That's like a cavity or a, or a balloon uh, that's inside this other cavity. The, cavity. the first cavity is the sun's domain, and then inside that balloon, if you can think of it, another balloon exists which is the Earth's balloon, and it's protected. And inside that, behind that shield, is the Earth's domain, our charged particles. Well, Jupiter has its own magnetosphere. And in fact, it's like everything else with Jupiter, it's the biggest. It's the biggest object in the entire solar system, is Jupiter's magnetosphere. If you could see it, it would look like the size of the moon. Uh, but of course, it's an invisible force field. But inside that magnetosphere, is Jupiter's domain. That's filled with its particles. It's blocked out the sun's particles. So when you get close enough to Jupiter, you move a transition from being in interplanetary space, the sun's domain, to going into Jupiter's domain. That means you're getting pretty close. Well, we crossed that boundary about a week ago, last Friday or so. And the science team spent some time arguing which day it was, because it wasn't, wasn't completely <laughs> clear. But we came to a conclusion that we think it happened last week. And I have that data to show to you. What you're going to see is something we call a spectrogram, which is a little bit complicated. It shows frequency and time, and the colors represent uh, intensity of the waves. It's from our waves instrument, so it's looking at plasma wave data. But the unique thing about that data is that data can be converted into audio. In other words, it's coming into a, a radio frequency, but we can hear some of those radio frequencies, just like you hear music. So if the human here can hear about 20 to 20,000 hertz, like I'm measuring, we're measuring electromagnetic waves that are in that range, so we can convert those into audio, and we can actually listen to what it's like to, to leave the sun and enter Jupiter. And that's what you're going to hear. Can I have that animation? Just the sound of it can tell you it's, it's non-trivial to go into Jupiter. <laughs> and so what you just crossed was what scientists call a bow shock. It's the same kind of thing that you hear about if you're on a, you know, listening about a, how a supersonic jet works, right? It flies through the fluid or the air and makes a shock in front, a shock wave. Uh, a boat going through the ocean creates a bow, right? Shock, a wave in front of that. 
That's what Jupiter's doing. It's plowing through the sun's domain, and it's created this bow shock, and we just crossed it. So we're there. We still got a lot to do on July 4th, <laughs> and I'm still nervous. But <laughs> we crossed it. We're, we're in Jupiter's domain at this point, and we're measuring the particles that are Jupiter, not the sun. So that was a big deal. So Juno does other kinds of science. I mean, besides the recipe and this, magnetos uh, this magnetosphere crossing, we, we're going to look at the whole polar magnetosphere, and you're going to hear that in a little bit. But a lot of what Juno is about is looking inside of Jupiter, seeing what is in the interior. And we basically have scientific instruments that look inside the planet in every way we know how. And that's what you're going to hear in the next couple of talks, is different ways to look inside of Jupiter beneath those beautiful clouds and meteorological features like the Great Red Spot and the zones and belts. And then eventually, how we explore the polar magnetosphere. OK, and so for that first part, I'm going to turn to Steve Levin, a good friend of ours. Hi. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the microwave radiometer instrument and how we measure what's probably the single most important number that Juno is going to bring back from Jupiter. And that's how much water does Jupiter have. The amount of water inside Jupiter is crucial to understanding how the solar system formed because it's crucial to understanding how did Jupiter formed. If Jupiter formed far from the sun where it's cold out of blocks of ice, frozen water at that great distance, you'll get a different amount of water inside Jupiter than if it formed closer to the sun where it is now or if it formed some other way than from starting with, with blocks of ice. So just by measuring that one number, the amount of water inside Jupiter, we can learn a lot about how Jupiter formed, and that teaches us not just about Jupiter, but about the whole solar system, about how solar systems form, because Jupiter formed sort of out of the leftovers from the sun, and the rest of the planets formed out of the leftovers from Jupiter. All right, so how are we going to do that? We're going to measure that with the microwave radiometer. And I'll show you in just a moment what the microwave radiometer looks like. But it's a radio receiver that uses the natural radio emission from Jupiter to look at six different channels that can see inside Jupiter and get the water. So if we go to that little animation, you can see the antennas on the spacecraft. And the, the largest microwave antenna for that radiometer is so big it fills up a whole side of the spacecraft. And the other five take up another side of the spacecraft. In fact, the overall dimensions of our spacecraft were partly determined by making it big enough to hold those antennas. And they're really important to us because they're going to get this key number. And the way we're going to do that is the fact that each of those channels can see a different depth into Jupiter. So if you go to that next slide, <clears throat> just to show each different channel sees below the water cloud or up to the water cloud, sees deep into Jupiter's atmosphere. And how deep they can see depends on how much water is in the atmosphere. What they see depends on the temperature of Jupiter's atmosphere as you go down, as it gets warmer, and that also depends on how much water is in Jupiter's atmosphere. So we can take the measurements from the microwave radiometer and use that to figure out how much water does Jupiter hold, which tells us about how did Jupiter form. If you go to the last picture I had, <clears throat> you can see that we also, because as the spacecraft comes by and it's rotating, because we can see each point on the planet from a range of different angles, we can do something like a CAT scan and get a three-dimensional picture of Jupiter's atmosphere. So we're seeing each of the six channels at different depths, and we're seeing with each of the six channels at a whole range of angles. The result is we get a three-dimensional picture of Jupiter's atmosphere to measure not just the water, but to see these amazing features like the great red spot, a storm bigger than the whole Earth, or those belts and zones, jet streams moving at hundreds of miles an hour. We get to see those in 3D with the radio receiver instead of just that two-dimensional picture that you can see on the screen. All right, so to talk a little bit more about how we can see inside Jupiter and go to greater depths, I'm going to pass it off to Jack Kinerny. If we're going to understand uh, Jupiter's interior, we're going to have to look a lot deeper than we can look with the MWR. And so to do that, we have two techniques. We measure the planet's gravitational field, and we measure its magnetic field. The gravitational field we measure just by looking at the orbit of Juno as it passes over the surface. 
The magnetic field we measure with a pair of instruments out at the pointy end of the solar array. And these two, uh, two methods will probe the deep interior of the planet. And uh, oddly enough, Jupiter's interior is uh, quite a mystery to us. And that's ironic because it's made up of the two simplest and most uh, abundant elements in the universe. That's hydrogen and, and helium. But the problem is it's under such great pressure in that environment that it behaves in very mysterious ways. So I can only explain to you what we think the interior of Jupiter looks like at this time. If we could roll the uh, animation. So uh, beneath the visible cloud tops that we see, there's a layer of molecular hydrogen that extends to great depths. And then beneath that, there's a, a core of metallic uh, conducting molecular hydrogen. What happens is the, the hydrogen atoms are pressed shoulder to shoulder so closely together that the electrons that are normally bound to the molecular hydrogen are free to roam about, uh, free to roam about the entire interior. That makes it a good electrical conductor. And then beneath that layer, we think there may be a, a dense core of heavy elements, everything heavier than, than hydrogen and helium. We don't know that that core is there. It may be 10 Earth masses, it may be 20 Earth masses, and part of this mission is to design to determine if there is a core at the center of Jupiter, and if that core was possibly the seed onto which the atmosphere uh, collected and made Jupiter the largest planet in our solar system. So uh, if I could have the next shot. This is a, a cross-section, uh, a wedge shape of uh, what we think the interior looks like. And you see that onion skin on top, that's the visible surface of the atmosphere that we're familiar with. And if you take a little chunk out of the topmost piece, that gives you the, the wedge to the right. And that's the, the region at top that the MWR can probe. That's the convective region of the atmosphere. It goes down to about 1,000 bars. With the magnetic field, we can penetrate deep below that surface. This uh, cutaway illustrates the metallic hydrogen, the blue region, which is a good electrical conductor. And that, that region around Jupiter that Scott Bolton just talked about that is defined by Jupiter's magnetic field, that's generated by a dynamo that may uh, be at the top of that metallic hydrogen region. We don't know for sure. It may be in the molecular uh, hydrogen region above, but it generates a magnetic field that's 20,000 times more powerful than the Earth's magnetic field. And that is what gives Jupiter uh, control over its own domain. So in order to determine where the dynamo is generated, we have to make a series of very accurate observations totally enveloping the planet. And so to do that, we've designed a mission plan that uh, takes Jupiter in its science orbits very close to the surface, uh, takes Juno, sorry, very close to the surface of Jupiter uh, in its 14-day orbits. And if I could show that uh, orbit clip, this shows you Juno in its elliptical orbit, racing over the surface uh, of Jupiter at its closest approach, and at the end of its 14-day orbit, the furthermost extreme is about 45 planet radii away. Jupiter rotates every 10 hours, roughly. And so we phase these orbits specifically so that we come by the, the surface, we probe different longitudes, and we space them out very carefully so that by the time we're done, we've enveloped uh, Jupiter in a dense net of observations that we need to characterize the magnetic field with the kind of resolution uh, that we are, are searching for here. So if I can have the next animation, I'll show you how that works. Uh, after a few orbits to set up this uh, mapping uh, plan, the subsequent orbits come down uh, separated by about 90 degrees, and you see J Juno traveling from north to south, from pole to pole, with every orbit. We do a, a slight uh, uh, orbital trim maneuver, and we phase these so that subsequent orbits, periapsis passes, come in in between previous periapsis passes. So by the time we're done with the nominal mission over 37 orbits, we have uh, periapsis passes separated in longitude by about 12 degrees, and that gives us a complete map 
completely encircling the planet and these very accurate measurements we need to probe really for the first time how a magnetic field is generated by a dynamo and what it looks like at the dynamo surface. So that's probably the most exciting part of the, of the mission for me. Uh, we can do this at Jupiter much more accurately and with much more resolution than we could ever do it in orbit about the Earth. And that's because Jupiter's dynamo is generated at a larger radius relative to the surface of the planet, so we have better signal to work with. And it's also because on Earth, when we try to image the dynamo, we have to look through a magnetized crust right beneath our feet. So Jupiter doesn't have that magnetized crust, and so there's nothing to obscure our view of dynamo action right down in the uh, interior of the planet where it's generated. So that's a very, very exciting opportunity that we have uh, in exploration of Jupiter that we could never do uh, in orbit about the Earth. But this mission plan and this trajectory that's designed to go from north to south brings us for the first time uh, above the poles of Jupiter into an entirely unexplored region of Jupiter's magnetosphere where I'm sure very uh, many discoveries await us. And so uh, to talk about those discoveries, I'm gonna hand it off to my good friend and colleague, Fran Baganel, talk about the aurora. Thank you very much, Jack. So as Scott said, the sphere of influence of this very strong magnetic field is vast. It's enormous. And it's sitting in this a wind of protons and electrons that are streaming out from the sun at a million miles an hour. And furthermore, as Juno has been observing, we know that that wind is gusty. It's blowing. And so this magnetosphere is changing and moving around as the gust of the solar wind comes and goes. So we have a very special opportunity with Juno coming in, uh, observing the variable um, solar wind. And what we want to know is what influence that has on the magnetic field and the environment close to Jupiter. And the easiest way to do that is to look at the aurora at the same time as Juno is measuring the solar wind. So let me talk a bit about the Jovian aurora, if we could have the picture here. This is a Hubble Space Telescope picture looking in the UV, the ultraviolet light, at these blue, they look blue, but it's ultraviolet in fact. Uh, these are energetic particles come in and bombard the atmosphere of Jupiter and make it glow. And you can see three main regions here. You can see a main auroral oval, which is a sort of round region that's very bright and fairly steady. Unlike the Earth's, it doesn't vary very much. The aurora, that part of the aurora, doesn't vary very much. We also see some bright spots, EO spot, the Europa spot, and the Ganymede footprint. These are the footprints of the magnetic field that go from the moons that are moving in this magnetic field there are very strong electrical currents, million amp electrical currents, that are coupling these moons moving through the magnetic field to the planet. And where the charged particles that are carrying those currents hit the atmosphere, they make it glow. And so you see these spots associated with the moons, Eo, Europa, and Ganymede. The third component of the aurora is the polar aurora, and you'll see bright spots in the center that are varying. Now, to illustrate all this and to help us understand the aurora, uh, I'm going to show you an animo animation in a minute that was taken by Hubble in the past uh, month or so. So the Hubble PI of this big campaign, Hubble's been looking at uh, the aurora uh, in the past few months, is here in the room, Johnny Nichols from the University of Leicester. And they've had uh, about 25 days, sorry, 25 uh, uh, days of observing many orbits of Hubble, looking at the aurora. So let's have this movie uh, of the aurora that was taken in the past month or so. And you can see, we're going to repeat it three times. Uh, this is a clip that is sped up about um, uh, 300 times. It lasts about 45 minutes. And you can see the main auroral oval. You can see the spot of Eo over on the right. And you can see a spot of Ganymede there too. But in the middle is this very variable uh, auroral polar region where it's coming and going. And what we really don't know is what is controlling that variability. 
Is it the solar wind varying? Or is it the interior of the magnetosphere, very dynamic magnetosphere, which swirls around and changes over time, uh, fueled by material, in fact, from that volcanic moon Eo? Uh, or is it an internal effect, or is it external? So one way to find out is to uh, observe the aurora uh, with Hubble, and in fact, there are many observatories here at Earth, either in orbit around the Earth or from the ground, looking at the aurora, looking at Jupiter at the same time that uh, Juno will be going into orbit. Uh, and so we'll get a measure of the variability of the solar wind upstream, the variability of the magnetosphere as we observe it in situ with, uh, with Juno, uh, as well as looking at the variability of the emissions um, from Earth. So, um, Let's have a look at the next uh, picture here. This shows you the size of what we're talking about. So if you look at the Earth, the size of the aurora there, shown in green uh, emission, uh, the, the Earth's atmosphere glowing, is about the size of the United States, the sort of size of the main uh, auroral region on the Earth. Uh, but when we compare it with the size of Jupiter, of course, Jupiter is about 11 times the size of the Earth, the auroral region is about five Earths across. So this is a big region, uh, and it is emitting a lot of power, about uh, 100 times the aurora that comes from, uh, auroral power that comes from Earth. And uh, it'll be telling us about the magnetosphere. Uh, and in particular, if we have the last of my pictures, you'll see here, we have this unique situation with uh, Juno. Flying over the poles, we look down on the aurora, in the UV and the infrared and in the visible with Juno Cam. And then we will be able to also fly through the region where the charged particles are coming in and bombarding the atmosphere. And so we'll be able to measure the acceleration processes that cause these auroral uh, effects, these emissions. And at the same time, we'll be measuring uh, plasma waves and uh, the perturbations in the magnetic field associated with those currents and the radio waves that come, that we've known for many decades, that come associated with the auroral emissions. So this is a very unique opportunity to be looking at this uh, very interesting phenomena, very bizarre um, glowing and flickering and so on associated with the aurora. Uh, but we've never been able to get up close and really observe these processes. So we can then compare them with what we see at Earth, what we see at Saturn, are the physical processes just similar, but we have a stronger field at Jupiter? Or do we have to really go back to the fundamental physics and work out what's really going on here? So we're really looking forward to a very exciting opportunity to look at the aurora in many different ways and different aspects. So I'll hand this back to Scott. Thanks, Fran. So uh, you can tell we're all really excited. The whole team is so thrilled. We're, we're really getting there, and we're so close to Jupiter. Um, we have a big event on July 4th, as you know, to go into orbit. It's uh, really important to us, and um, we're about to jump on that, that Jupiter train. So we also have a camera um, that's called JunoCam, and it's a public outreach camera, and we uh, make those images and even the data available uh, to the public through our websites. And I want to show you uh, another picture that we're uh, releasing today um, from JunoCam. Can I get that um, picture? So this picture was taken a couple days ago of Jupiter. Um, some of the unique uh, or exciting ideas is that you're not only can you start to see the, uh, the colors and the zones and belts of Jupiter, but you can actually see the red spot in this image. And you see three of the Galilean moons. Um, the lower one um, is Europa. It's actually the second moon. The one just above that is Io, and that's the closest Galilean moon. That's the most volcanic body in the solar system. And then the furthest out one is Ganymede, and those bodies uh, are, those are the satellites moving around Jupiter. Those are three of the four Galilean satellites. And in the auroral pictures that you saw um, that Fran just showed, the footprints of those are in the aurora. So there's an umbilical cord through the magnetic field that's tying those moons into Jupiter. And they're sending particles back and forth. And when the particles from those moons go into Jupiter, they light up. And that's kind of cool. 
So uh, I hope you all join us. We're getting really close. Um, we're really excited. We want to invite everybody along for the ride. Come see us on July 4th. Thank you. Back to you, DC. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so we're going to open it up to the floor here at JPL uh, for any questions from the media. Uh, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. Uh, Emily over there. And please uh, wait for the microphone. Please state your name and media affiliation. Hi, uh, Emily Lakdawalla, the Planetary Society. I think this is for Steve. It's a question about the hydrogen in, that you're looking for in Jupiter. How do you know that the water that you're going to be measuring there is primordial water, that, that it's not kind of exchanged with the supply of hy molecular hydrogen in Jupiter? How do you tell the difference between those two? Okay, so remember, uh, it's really the oxygen that we're, we're after, right? Wa water is H2O. Jupiter is mostly hydrogen. The next most abundant element is helium. But the third most abundant element in the solar system is oxygen. And yet, so far, we haven't found very much oxygen in Jupiter. So we're looking for water because that's the form in which oxygen will be found. But it's, just, it's the oxygen we're after. And it's got to be primordial because you can't really affect Jupiter with small things. If, you know, a few years back when a comet hit Jupiter, the mass of that compared to the size of Jupiter is very small. So the amount of water we find in Jupiter should be representative of the water that got there when the planet formed in its early history. Does that answer what you were asking about? It does. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in the back row there, please state your name and media affiliation. Uh, hi, I'm Devin Coldaway with TechCrunch. Um, I was curious, um, Steve, you mentioned the magnetic field being about 20,000 times stronger than the Earth's. Uh, I'm curious about the scales of other major deviations uh, like the the, I mean, the scale of the pressure that would be needed to create metallic hydrogen, uh, radiation, and stuff like that. I'm just curious about the, the other sort of huge magnitude uh, factors in Jupiter and whether we're going to find out much more about those. So it's actually Jack who mentioned uh, oh, the magnetic field, me. and he's our magnetic field expert as well. So I'm going to let him answer. OK, thanks, Steve. Uh, so the, the dynamo generates this magnetic field. It needs a lot of uh, energy, a lot of power to do it. Uh, but you have to have a, a conductive fluid, and it has to be in some kind of a convective motion that drags the magnetic field uh, around with the fluid and manages to sustain a dynamo, just like the Earth's dynamo. Of course, the Earth's magnetic field flips every couple hundred thousand years. We don't know if Jupiter's magnetic field flips uh, or not. I suspect it does. Um, but it's, uh, it's enormously strong because Everything about Jupiter is enormous. Uh, the gravity is, is huge. Uh, the planet itself is huge. The part of the planet that is conductive, that can participate in a dynamo, is, is huge. So it's no surprise that it generates a, a magnetic field that's about 20,000 times more uh, powerful than the Earth's magnetic field. But uh, Jupiter itself is such a large body that uh, when you're at the surface, you're kind of far from where the field is generated. Uh, and at the surface, the field magnitude is only about 20 times the field magnitude of the surface of the Earth. But even still, this, this spacecraft is going to fly in space through a magnetic field that is 10 times greater than anything we've ever experienced. And so that's one of the curiosities. We're going to have to see how it, it performs when we do that. Great. Uh, gentleman in the front row. Jay Pasikoff, representing the Huffington Post. Uh, you have staged the, fly, the close flybys uh, to cover all the longitudes of Jupiter, but Jupiter's surface, of course, is in differential rotation. Uh, are you, how are you planning to un uncouple the atmosphere, or are you just looking through the atmosphere and it's more stable below? And as a second question, um, can you give us some timeline for the insertion when the key point? key times for us to be worried or pleased on July 4th will be. So we'll let Jack take the first part of the question, and then maybe Ed can answer the second part. Uh, OK, so uh, we phase these orbits so that we get the uh, equally spaced longitudes. Uh, what's happening at the very top of the atmosphere, the part that we see, the, the belts and zones that are red and white, they are in differential rotation. You're, you're very right. 
Now, that's not where the magnetic field is generated, though. The magnetic field is, is, is deep below that. And it's a good question. We don't know how deep that convective motion is in the atmosphere. But what we do know is that that magnetic field rotates uh, like a clock. We've been measuring via the radio emissions we get from Jupiter uh, for 40, 50 years, uh, ever since 60, it was first discovered. 60, 60, and 65, 65 years. OK, friend. <laughs> 55. Uh, you get the idea. When I was born. Uh, I know. We've been measuring it for a long, long time. And, uh, and so it's very precise. It's like a clock. And, and so we know that the interior rotates uh, as, a, as a body uh, with that 10-hour rotation rate. Thank you, Fran. Uh, I want to add in here that uh, we measure our longitude, uh, what we call system three longitude, is based on the magnetic field. So we use that as our our way of measuring longitude and mapping it around. We don't care what happens to the clouds. The clouds come and go. What we're interested in is that magnetic longitude. So you can see it's not, not necessarily easy to manage this team. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there are atmospheric scientists that are interested in the field and we uh, in the atmospheric clouds too. So we have them on the team. But um, let me, uh, Fran's right. So the rotation of Jupiter, the rotation period itself is basically defined by the rotation of the magnetic field. And then, but one thing you should realize is we also measure the gravity field very precisely during this mission. And one of the goals of that is to understand how it's rotating inside, how deep, and when does that rotation start and how does it work? Um, let me go back to Ed for the, the details of the orbit insertion times. Yeah. the the. Two key times that I would keep an eye on are when the main engine burn starts and when it stops. Um, and the, the signal that we get, the, the event will be over by the time we see that happen. There's 48 minutes of light time for the signal to reach um, from Jupiter to the Earth. We get the signal that the main engine burn started at 8.18 8 p.m. Pacific time, and then 35 minutes after that, at 8.53 p.m., we'll see the signal that the main engine burn has stopped. Um, there's obviously activity before and after that, and we can get you a more detailed timeline. Um, but those are the really two key times on July 4th. Okay, thank you, Ed and panel. And I understand we have a question from uh, media on the phone. So uh, please state your name and media affiliation. Hi, thanks, DC. It's Irene Klotz with Reuters. I have a couple questions. Um, for Scott, you uh, mentioned in your opening comments that you uh, still feel a little nervous about the upcoming uh, burn and the uh, um, orbit insertion. If you could maybe just talk a little bit about what about that gives you pause and also give us the speed that Juno will be moving relative to Earth uh, just before the burn starts and the speed of the spacecraft when the burn is finished. Okay, so uh, did I say little in the nervous? Um, <laughs> that was probably a misstatement. Uh, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm a, I, I have mixed emotions. I'm excited uh, and, and with anticipation, of course, because we're finally arriving. But I've also uh, have tension and nervousness because there's a lot riding on what happens July 4th. We have to perform this critical maneuver. The, as Ed described, the, the rocket motor has to burn uh, at just the right time, uh, in the right direction, uh, at the right moment for the right amount of time for us to get into orbit. And if that doesn't all go just right, uh, we fly past Jupiter. And uh, of course, the, that's not desirable. We would like to go into orbit to do the science. So, um, so that part of it is challenging, and of course, um, the idea that we're going into this uh, planet, this extreme environment that, that is so much greater than anything we've ever experienced before, is all happening for the first time when we have to fire this, this uh, complicated, delicate maneuver. And, um, and, so, and, and having the lack of any control, it's all automated, right? So the light time between Jupiter and Earth is 40 minutes. Uh, or so, or more than 40 minutes. And so the whole burn is about 35 minutes. So, so everything's automated. The spacecraft's a smart robot. We've tested everything, but still everything's riding on it. And, and um, I kind of felt the same way when I was uh, at the launch 
I was so excited to be there that we were finally leaving Earth and launching on the rocket to go to Jupiter. But I kept looking and thinking, gosh, the whole spacecraft's on top of that rocket. <laughs> what if something happens? And, uh, and that's a big risk, uh, you know. And of course, um, you don't get the great gains um, of reaching out, you know, and exploring and learning about nature unless you take those risks. So I'm not against the risks, but it doesn't uh, mean that I'm not nervous. Um, the second part of the question was the speed. Um, so I, I may not remember all of these. We may have to get that to you. But I think at the time uh, that we arrived there, right before the burn, we're moving about 160,000 or 165,000 miles an hour. So we're, we're relative to Earth. So that's uh, incredibly fast. And I don't think we've uh, had anything, any human object that's moved that fast that's left the Earth. Um, after the burn, uh, somebody would have, I, I don't have that number at the top of my fingertips relative to Earth. Thanks. Um, the other question I have is just about the um, kind of the big picture science of uh, understanding more about how and where uh, Jupiter formed. Um, what is the kind of the range of opinions on uh, where that, where the planet um, started off and how it got to where it is today? I know that's a really big question for a short press conference, but if there's a way to kind of generalized, um, even just how divided the community is on the question, that'd be helpful. Thanks. Well, I, I, I think there's, um, there's a lot of scientists on the team, and there are many scientists not on the team, and, and um, there's not a consensus on, on the answer of where Jupiter formed. Um, you know, initially, we, it's, at, it's at five times the distance of the sun, and that was sort of the idea traditionally. Um, now there are models that show uh, planetary migration might exist. Jupiter may have moved uh, to its present location from further out, forming further out, um, trying to explain the composition. Um, some, some models show Jupiter forming out uh, near Uranus or Neptune and then moving in. But the, uh, the, the truth is, is we don't know the answer to that. And, and one of the big clues will be the oxygen abundance and how much water is in Jupiter um, that will help us. But, but also the core will also help that. Great. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I understand we have some questions from social media. Jason? Indeed. First question here comes from uh, RIA Nov Novostovi reporter uh, from a newswire service here asking, how will NASA deal with solar panel fouling and degradation in the course of the mission? What are the chances that it will last longer than planned? I can take it. Um, so, so we have um, solar arrays that are um, tested and specifically designed to be able to last through the cold temperatures and the high levels of radiation. They have a cover glass on them. But we also have designed into the mission uh, the ability to um, have some of those decrease in their efficiency for producing electricity. And, uh, and so if, if uh, there's a huge amount of energy that's lost, more than we've accounted for and more than the margin and the reserves that we've already taken into account, we can um, reduce the amount of energy consumption by uh, time sharing on the in scientific instruments, but we don't think we're going to need to do that. All right. Next question comes from a Twitter user, Perlobby, who asks, what's the average lifespan for the instruments given Jupiter's environment? So I'll take that one too. That varies a little bit. There are um, the instruments that have all of their electronics uh, inside the vault um, are designed to last through the end of the mission, all the way th through the completion of all the orbits. We have a couple of instruments that were added late that we um, did not feel we needed to put into that radiation, the same kind of level of radiation uh, protection. Um, I think the uh, infrared camera and the visible camera um, are outside that box. And they were, and, uh, and they were designed to um, be able to last long enough to accomplish all the science objectives. But our analysis now uh, indicates that they'll probably last much longer. So, um, but there's there's a little bit of variation. So some of them last through the, about the first half of the mission, and uh, but the bulk of the science instruments go all through the whole mission. 
All right, coming off of our Ustream feed here, um, Penn State Phil asks, uh, if Juno determines there is a solid core, can it detect what elements that core might be made of? I'll let Jack take that. <laughs> well, thank you, Scott. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't believe so. Uh, we'll know what the, what the mass is, uh, the, uh, the summation of mass there, but we won't be able to identify whether it's iron or lithium or, or what the elements are. It might also be pointing out, because the question assumed it was solid core. We're talking about a dense core in the center of Jupiter. It may not be a solid. So I've been going to all these science team meetings for many years, certainly since the last five years. And every time I have a science team meeting, the interiors group come up with a different theory for how this material works at these very high pressures. We're working in a new environment, which we, we don't know the physics of how things work at these high pressures. And they're coming up with theoretical quantum, mecha quantum mechanical models, but they can be wrong. And so we're going to make the observations that will be key, they will be important. But I'll bet you that the theorists are going to keep ad adjusting and adapting their models, uh, but we've, we will have constraints. Wonderful. This last question comes from uh, Twitter user Carl, who asks, when will we get the first images uh, from Jupiter after JOI? Um, when? We turn the instruments back on about two days after. So. Yeah, um, uh, we turn the instruments on just a couple of days later, but I'm not sure what the schedule is to send down the, the first image after that happens. We'll have to get back to you on that. OK, great. I understand. I understand we have a follow-up question from Irene Klotz at Reuters. Uh, Irene, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, for Scott, I just was wondering if there is um, something more dynamic or more um, challenging about going into a polar orbit around Jupiter versus the um, orbit that Galileo uh, put itself into um, many, many years ago. And um, also, if you could just characterize, you've, you've, you've um, portrayed this mission as um, the spacecraft that will come closest to Jupiter, but just was wondering if you could put that into context with the hour of data that the Galileo atmospheric probe was able to send back. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, the Galileo probe, of course, went into Jupiter, but it, uh, when we talk about the closest of uh, the spacecraft, we mean in orbit. So Galileo probe wasn't in orbit around Jupiter. This is the closest orbit uh, that the spacecraft has uh, gone into around Jupiter. And it's considerably closer than Galileo's orbit, which was started out at about um, four Jovian radii and then, and then went out further from that until the very end of the mission. They, they of course, went in to Jupiter, but again, they, they weren't really in orbit. They were uh, going in to dispose of the spacecraft. Um, the polar orbit itself is, is, is challenging, um, but when you're coming in from essentially infinity and you're arriving at Jupiter, you can target over the pole or over the equator and basically enable yourself to choose that inclination. So the, the, the challenging part of the, or aspect of the, of the Juno orbit is the fact that we're so close. We're both polar and we're going in so close that we're threading a needle between the radiation belts uh, and, the, and the atmosphere and, and getting into what we believe is a gap in the radiation. And, and each time you go over the poles, there's parts of the radiation belts that are, that are reaching out uh, into higher latitudes, and you're, and you're getting closer and closer to those. And so that polar part of the, that polar aspect of the magnetosphere puts you in jeopardy because you're closer to these other parts of the radiation belts. Great. Thank you, Scott. I understand we have a follow up from Emily. Yeah, um, you showed data from the plasma waves instrument and JunoCam. I'm wondering about the rest of the science instruments. Have they been on? Have they uh, taken data yet that's relevant to the study of Jupiter? Have they all gotten data? Are the scientists happy? I think the scientists are generally happy. Um, we've got a lot of data. Um, not all of it is, uh, is uh, easy uh, to analyze and interpret, so um, we've provided some insights into some of the data that we were uh, more straightforward to understand. But we are definitely analyzing the other data that uh, we get throughout the, about the solar wind and uh, UV data on the aurora and things that we are taking ourselves. And, um, and as we get 
through that and interpret it and get ready to write the publications and understand it, we'll, of course, release it. Great. Well, thank you. I think that's going to do it for us here today at JPL. Uh, this is the first of two briefings, though, so please stick around for the second one, which will start uh, pretty close to the top of the hour. Uh, for more information about Juno, please visit nasa.gov slash Juno and missionjuno.swiri.edu. And for those of you who want to join <clears throat> in on the conversation, visit on Facebook or Twitter, facebook.com, NASA Juno, and twitter.com slash NASA Juno. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and please join us as well on July 4th. Uh, it's a big day for us here at JPL and for the Juno mission. Things start off at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time with another briefing here in Von Karman Auditorium. And then at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, we'll start commentary uh, for the uh, Jupiter orbit insertion. Uh, so want to thank you for your time. Thanks the panel for their time, and uh, have a good day. <laughs>